Hello and welcome to the Neurotech SF Hack Night for October 7th. Uh, thanks for joining us. Very excited to be here with everyone today. Um, big news that we're going to be focusing a lot of our discussion today um, is around the UCSF publication announcement, Nature Magazine article, and so on, that they created a custom treatment for serious treatment re resistant depression using deep brain stimulation with an implanted uh, stimulator. But it's really, really interesting. There's an in-depth article. It's a three-day process. Um, the patient came on site. They identified a key biomarker. Then they came up with a treatment. Then they implanted the stimulator for that brain region where they believe the source of the problem was. It seems to be working. Um, really interesting. The They have a GitHub repo that has a lot of their code. I don't know if it has the full data set, but I think it actually has the scrubbed data for this particular thing, which is amazing. And then um, the researcher is available if you if you email them to get it. So super exciting hack night. Um, looking forward to talking about brain stimulation, TACS, TDCS. Uh, but really, this customized treatment using interventions that are first measured and then delivered to treat something specific, and then you can see the change after the treatment. I really think that this is going to be a huge, huge shift, huge area of application for BCI. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of catch 22s. We have all definitely seen the, the motorized car demos and, and other devices that people have been able to sort of control. But this, I think, is really going to take the application of BCI to digital medicine and digital therapeutics. And uh, of course, we have to tread lightly because of the FDA and all these sorts of claims. But still, I, I do believe many things in this direction are, are coming down the road. And I think it's going to be really interesting. Okay, so before we get started, I did want to mention we have a whole lot of new people. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you. So in case you haven't been to one of our hack nights before. Um, we stream this on YouTube. We um, have the archive. We upload it as well. And um, what we're here to do is just basically discuss neuroscience, any topics of interest to you, any questions that you've had. And we love projects. Like if you if you're working on anything BCI data or anything, we would just love to know the details of um, of what you have going. And if on that note, if anybody wants to come up, introduce themselves, um, say what they're passionate about or their area of interest or something that they'd like to discuss, uh, please let me know. You know, you can just uh, send me a message, raise your hand, say that you want to speak, uh, and we would love to have your your comments and input. Uh, the first little bit tends to be more of a presentation style, just because we try to tee up a topic for discussion. But then on the other hand. I mean, the whole point of this is to have a discussion. The whole point of this is to look at this from sort of a functional perspective, to talk about data, to talk about devices, to talk about treatments. And so, yeah, always, um, always very excited to have any any input from the from anyone. So, if you'd like to say hi, if you'd like to talk about something that interests you, uh, we can do that. Um, let's see. We have our first question talking about mind or partial mind uploading. Well, this is actually a really cool topic. All right, so uh, two things. First off, Ray Kurzweil says yes. Uh, he's a Bay Area technologist who definitely thinks that we are headed towards the digital singularity and that we will be uploading our brains. And um, he is hoping to live long enough to reach that point so that he doesn't actually pass away. But in a slightly more um, recent example, what? what we're talking about with this question. I know it might seem a little fantastic, but let me hit you with a little bit of that um, science fiction becomes reality in 2021. And uh, this was just on the Neurotech X Slack. So I'm going to go look at this. And, and some of you, maybe you're thinking of like, hey, Slava's post about those Samsung. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going with it. OK, so um, let's see. We're going to look at the general channel because that's where the good stuff happens. Okay. 
So robotic arm, Samsung is copying and pasting the brain on neuromorphic chips using nano electrodes. Now you'll have to, I understand your skepticism because now we're talking nano as well as brain uploading and it's like, all right, we're in, we're in buzzword bingo. However, this buzzword bingo is being done by Harvard, which makes it far more credible just immediately, you know, like in terms of credibility of MIT Media Lab, Harvard, everyone else. I am definitely joking. Um, so in this case, Harvard and Samsung. All right, let's look at this right here. I'm going to share that. Oh, oh, awesome. I, yeah, I would love to see um, the brain attached. Yeah, I mean, maybe even sooner but yeah let's do just a quick touch on the ucsf paper i would love to love to have some some comments and inputs uh maybe in just a few minutes okay so let's take a look at this right here uh, uh share the screen and yes samsung electronics brain on a memory chip so um this was published just a few days ago so if you're asking, are people working on uploading the brain to a chip? Yeah, yeah. And this is sort of a tangible example of how close we are getting to that, which is sort of getting, I guess, chips that imitate neuronal activity, neuromorphic. Um, let's see, copy and paste. All right. Copy the brain's neuronal connection app using a nano electrode array and uh, paste it. All right, so basically like a SSD of neurons. Yeah, that's pretty. So the SSDs usually use stacked uh, memory cells. And uh, it's interesting that this is sort of like a extension of that process, or it just has some similarities because Samsung's really proficient in it and then um, seems to be trying this approach. Pretty fascinating. So yeah, um, SSD type brain chip uh, coming on the way. And I do think that that was a plot element in that recent um, cyberpunk game. I'm gonna close the video so that you don't get the inception effect. But yeah, it's, uh, it's on the way. Um, I guess the only question is the time frame. Um, you know, a conservative time frame might be 100 years, um, 50 years if we're kind of hedging and 20 years if you're an optimist or pessimist, depending on which way the digital future strikes you. Uh, but yeah, maybe those are the time frames that we're talking about on, uh, on our cyberpunk future. So pretty cool. Um, yes. So let's see. Uh, so I downloaded the paper and let's look at the GitHub repo. And I think it's so amazing that they made the GitHub repo. Let's look at the nature article. And uh, let's let's do all of that in one moment. All right. So here is the paper from Nature, and I guess actually we can take a step back and try to find the uh, stuff write up because it just kind of has the more plain language. Uh, so yes, this article was published on the 4th. This is hot off the presses three days ago. And um, it is pretty cool that uh, this used an individualized treatment approach. And they do describe that in detail in the paper. Um, let's see if we can kind of Limited success using deep brain stimulation in the past. Uh, I guess this is a proof of concept, proof of principle trial where they wanted to find a specific biomarker, tune a device that would only fire when the specific sequence or stimulus presented. And they wanted to see if it improved things. And it seems like in this case, um, the patient found it immediately um, beneficial. So let's see here. Okay. So starting in 2014, the Brain Initiative, which is really cool that that kind of helped bring things along downstream a few years later. Uh, okay. Depression and anxiety, 
Now, in the paper, they talk about gamma, like really targeting a lot of gamma activity and the modulation and so on. But I'm just looking to see if um, this article has a little bit of sort of a, a summarization. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay. So customized treatment. They got an exemption in 2020 FDA. Okay. And this was a neurostim device for epilepsy. Okay. And in this case, they were able to do like a similar type of device for this particular patient with depression that wasn't responding to any other treatment. So they found, they localized the region of the brain activity that they felt was the issue. And they did that so that they could target where the stimulator would be placed properly. And now they have a, a device that monitors when the target condition is met. So it doesn't apply the stimulus indiscriminately. It only applies the stimulus when it's, it's when the, 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 the region of the brain responsible for the brain depression that they localized is activating in the way that they consider undesirable, then it fires the device. Uh, and in this case, it's a one milliamp dose for six seconds. And um, I guess it doesn't, doesn't say here whether that repeats, but that does seem like a pretty, pretty quick, sudden intervention, pretty awesome. And Yes. Okay. So the first stimulation they did, I guess, manually. And then once they figured out that they worked, then they put an implanted device. Pretty cool. So patient feels it helped. Awesome. Okay. So that is the write-up. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and pause. Okay. Um, before we dive into the paper and the GitHub, I think that kind of gives us a little bit of a general sense. Sorry, I was a little hazy as I was reading it, but basically, um, find the brain region. Hey, here's the activity. Okay, we have a target of what we think is wrong and what we want to stimulate. We apply the stimulus. We see the changes. It sounds like, uh, again, from the data on GitHub, it sounds like they're looking for gamma-related changes. And then, okay, when we see the change in the data, the patient agrees that this improved their uh, symptoms. Bam, we have detected, come up with a custom treatment, applied it, and it seems to be working. Pretty cool. Okay, so let's take a look at the nature paper, and we'll take a look at the GitHub. Okay, so let me go ahead and share the screen again. Okay, so if you look at the nature paper, closed loop neuromodulate in an individual with treatment resistant depression from the Chang lab, the same lab that was working with Facebook on the BCI project as well. And uh, they showed the GitHub here. I thought this was really cool. GitHub.com, ScanGhost Lab, or I'm sorry, it could have been uh, the ScanGhost Lab with Professor Chan helping. But um, closed loop MDD, okay. So this gives you the source data and it also gives you some IPython notebooks of how they processed it. And I, It's really rare to see this and I think this is really cool. So let's take a look at the uh, paper. I'm not sure, yes, we are sharing, okay, cool. So. Let's take a look at the paper and then let's take a look at the, the data and the plots and how basically to generate them. I really think it's really cool. Okay, so here is the quick and dirty. Um, yes, yes, I paid money and you got it from me. Okay, deep brain stimulation is a promising treatment. Yes, um, first used multi-day intracranial Electrophysiology and focal electrical stimulation to identify a personalized symptom-specific biomarker and a treatment location where stimulation improved symptoms. I just think this is a pretty big deal. Uh, it's really cool. It's a significant thing. 
uh, depression is such a such a major concern for people, health authorities, everyone, and um, especially with the pandemic sort of isolating people further and a lot, some people experiencing a lot of hardship and a lot of so it is awesome to see that we have found sort of an actual targeted individualized treatment. Okay, uh, implant a chronic deep brain sensing and stimulation device. So one of the cool advancement on a lot of these stim devices is that they have a sensing component now, instead of simply being timing based, you know, pulse every hour and hope that that works. Or, you know, instead of being patient driven in the sense of figure out that you're depressed, do something on your phone or, you know, an app, and then it's going to uh, signal the electrode. But this is uh, nice because it basically it's automated. It just sits there and waits for the condition to be met and then delivers a stimulation. So closed loop therapy, it was only one person. So N of one. On the other hand, I think like in a strange way, personalized treatments are going to be small N count studies because each one is personalized. And I guess in that sense, you can sort of do a clustering of them, kind of get yourself a bunch of data that way. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's really cool, right? This was personalized to this person and it treated their depression. Okay, so I'm gonna skim through this, um, but I wanted to show you, okay, the plots that we generate and yes, all the, all the data is in there and, and where the activity was happening, the biomarker detection. I believe that they used wavelets more like, or I'm sorry, just wavelet decomposition from the scalagram, just looking at the, the Git code. Um, they have a low symptom state and a high symptom state. So here's your clustering. Um, the feature performance, now the, these plots are pretty prominent in the Git, um, but there isn't a little bit about the feature selection and, and what criteria, I mean, definitely it gets covered, but I think it's, uh, it's it's pretty interesting, the good feature selection numbers that they got. So I would definitely want to dive into that a bit more. Area under curve uh, shows that this is true positives more than false positive. The brain region connectivity mapping, they give you the code for this, uh, brain region by contact, and here is your, I guess, time responses. Let's see what F is. One second. Example of dose dependent mean evoked potentials left. So, based on the stimulation of the current, these are the changes. It's, wow, it's pretty interesting. So, one milliamp is the gray, three milliamp is the light blue, six milliamp is the darker blue and 10 milliamp is the one that's the darkest at the bottom. So yeah, it's interesting. You can see some significant changes there based on the dosage of the stimulation. The connectivity and the change in biomarker after stim. Symptoms seem to improve. Okay, and this is over 20 pulses. Okay, so um, here is the stimulation lead and the sensing lead. So this is the implanted device right here. Pretty cool. And let's see what have we got. All right. Once again, these plots showing the difference in treatments, difference in gamma power for contacts three and four. So I guess that's where they felt like the most significant changes. And yeah, plenty of plots showing the difference in uh, brain connectivity, activity in specific regions and so on. So what is really cool about this is the code to generate these, which also means that the analytical method used is right here on Git. And what do I mean? Well, if you like one of the figures that they plotted or some of the figures, you can open up 
the Git repo and look at the actual code. And I think this is pretty cool. So pandas, numpy, matplotlib, seaborn, uh, pretty standard stuff, sklearn. It, when I say standard stuff, that's great. This isn't some custom toolkit that you can't get access to. This is bog standard Python stuff. So if you have some familiarity with data science in Python, you can run this. And they give you the CSV, the, the data, and, and they give you the notebook. That is really, really cool. I'm so happy about that. Dr. Voice Text Lab at UCSF also seems to go out of their way to, I'm sorry, geez, UCSD. Um, ah, goes out of his way to publish the code and uh, and it's wonderful and it really helps. So this is, this is really cool. So um, you can scroll through and look at their Python code and then you can look at the plots that are being generated. So frequency of feature selection through sklearn, you got it. And it turns out that the LA and RA, or I guess this LA gamma. And so that's, I guess, the region that they felt was most varied by the changes or the onset of the stimuli. That's my best guess, and I apologize if that's wrong. So here is the clustering code. And yep, K means SK learn. So here we go. Here's the various treatments. And this is what we saw here, I believe. Yeah. So I think it's really cool that you can generate the same plots using the same data as published scientists. Like, if you want to start getting familiar with how these things work or what exactly is happening or what it's like to, to do this research or publish or do the calculations that go into it, you can get a pretty good idea by sort of going through the paper and then um, looking through the notebooks and seeing the code. Of course, this stuff is fairly in depth. You have to be somewhat familiar with these things if you're completely, if you've never looked at Python before, if you're not familiar with EEG and a lot of the processing that goes into this, it's going to be tricky, but it is cool that the data is there. And if you're simply looking to understand, okay, what set of calculations or transformations did they do here? And can I do the same thing with my data? What's cool is you can. Now, you may not have a high density EEG uh, if you're using consumer hardware. So some of these tools are probably not going to be super helpful, but others will. Like the k-means clustering, depending on what you cluster, that's a technique that you can do with, with anything. So it may be somewhat specific to this data set in this particular experiment and this study and all those other things. But it is really, really cool to see working examples of, hey, this, this lab used these methods to do these calculations and make these claims. You can assume that it's sound because it's in nature. So, hey. Um, you can now repeat their methods. Pretty cool. So now you look at the, uh, they have the plots for the effective network connectivity. I personally, you know, find the connectivity stuff, whatever, but it is cool. Look at this, here is the map. So if you want to make one of these plots, here you go. And obviously don't take my whatever connectivity observations I have, I mean, they were able to find the region, they were able to localize it, they were able to stimulate it, and it worked. So definitely that method was sound. Just you're going to have a hard time with low density BCIs sort of replicating these sort of component analysis things that require lots of electrodes to compute. And all that means is just it's going to be hard to replicate those methods using data that you collect. But I would say half of the methods you can do quite easily with consumer hardware. And they're all available here, so you can just use the appropriate ones. Um, but yeah, it is really, really cool that, I mean, I think I didn't have time for today's call to see whether 
I could actually download any of these and get it running and grab the data set and so on. But I'd actually be quite happy to dig into it in more detail because it is available. So I'm going to send an email and see if we can get the, the raw data. And then obviously I'm going to try to get these scripts going, get them in my Python environment and see if I can download the prep data, just get the calculations going so that I can show people if you like, oh, well, if you change this parameter or what happens this or what are we looking for? I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be nice like that from the data. But yeah, just from a, let's see, reproducibility, right? Here they show you the, the, the things that generated the plots. Okay. And here's the stim sites. That is really cool. Positive correlation between the number of gamma detections. So the other thing I'll try to get a sense of is what exactly they're using as the biomarker. I don't know if I can search the paper. Okay. Symptom specific amygdala gamma power. So basically they just went for BCBS contacts. And this is where I embarrass myself by not knowing what the VCVS is. And an, ah, ventral capsule. Oh, of course. But there you go. Uh, I still don't know what that is. <laughs> that's, that's the important part to understand. The amygdala I have heard of. But um, yeah, the, uh, there we go. So they were looking for gamma power in that region. And they found it. Let's see. Let's see if we can identify what exactly. We found a bilateral amygdala gamma alone is sufficient high symptom severity state. Okay. And what, what was the change? Well, I can dig into that and try to get like the actual magnitude or amplitude of the gamma power change. But yeah, so if you want a funny example, uh, nothing fun. It's a uh, terrible. So, um, it's a funny example, but the, the spicy stimulus that we did with the capsaicin generated a really strong beta and a really strong gamma response. Um, it was cool because we were able to see it. And the typical change in gamma was like a, a fourfold power increase. Now this might not be as coarse because it's a little more targeted. It's maybe one region or one electrode that we're going for, maybe a smaller change, but um, it does seem like it's related to gamma on the amygdala so that it's like a fairly, and, and I think that this would, um... oh yeah, yeah, oh. We'll have to talk about the Nobel Prize as well. Yeah, that is so. That was that was wonderful news. I was so excited to uh, to hear that. Um, but yeah, I was I was just really. Uh, it, it was great to see that, you know, here we found this way that we could use a consumer BCI and like some ten dollar <laughs> capsaicin supplement from Amazon and actually get a legit response. And John got one. Richard got one. I got one. Um, I can't remember who else, uh, necessarily submitted, but yeah, it worked great. So it is, it is really, really cool. Um, also let's see, I, I just have to say that just this targeted treatment seems like it's right on the horizon. This, this ability, Hey, let's get you in. Oh, here is, um, something about your brain signaling that is slightly out of the norm no problem. We can nudge it in this direction. Let's see what happens. Oh, that worked. Great. And I, I just think that that is, and, and we can measure that it changed. We say, oh, here was the state before, here's the state after. You didn't feel great with this state. You feel better with this state. Cool. I, I do think that that is an incredibly valid method. And I think that that 
pushes us towards the measurement side on the on the BCI. Like, let's get these sensors better. Let's get an understanding and so on. And it definitely pushes us on the treatment side. And uh, so I would love to hear about brain attach take on brain stim and what they think of this as well. Uh, I don't know if you're ready to, I can invite you up and then maybe you can take a, a minute, see if the, the stuff works, the connection. Let's see how that goes. Hey, thanks for joining us. Hello, I hope that the voice is this time a bit better. Yes, it's okay. Yeah, great. Nice to be here. I've watched quite a lot of your shows. Oh, yeah? Well, well, you're in you... the middle of the night for me. <laughs> it's 10 hour difference. What did yeah. you think of our experiments that we've been running the last few weeks? Yeah, I'd really like to hear you uh, about the experiments. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what, is, what is your take on this big announcement from UCSF, brain stim, the implanted stimulator? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And I would love to, maybe if you could just talk a little bit more about, you know, TACS, PDCS, because um, it was such a wonderful presentation that you gave at the, at the showcase event. Thank you. <laughs> I tried my best. Uh, I even prepared something. Uh, I, I was really happy that they discerned the different gammas. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed the topic. Uh, but uh, is this one? Yeah, okay. So uh, now I found that I didn't post anything about neuroscience for quite a lot of, lot of time. Uh, that's uh, uh, information about uh, how cur how frequencies uh, correlate uh, in normal EEG, so this is not uh, intracranial, that's just normal uh, EEG. Uh, maybe this one will be a bit easier. Uh, because to start it, uh, this is a result of uh, our internal model. We have uh, in brain attached, we have internal model for uh, working with EEG. Uh, that's why we can measure what we are measuring, because we are using a little bit different uh, statistical principles. Uh, but they they map quite well to everything that uh, anybody is using. Uh, the important thing is that you can see gammas quite uh, clearly in normal EEG. Uh, and I found that uh, the literature about intracranial uh, gammas is the only place where I can find some uh, mappings between what we can find uh, and uh, what people are writing. Uh, the most uh, interesting thing, I think, uh, will be uh, the split uh, that in the normal EEG and in cranial, you can see uh, a few different, um, you can see at least three different gammas. And oh. the literature s s says the same. You have uh, like low gamma, which is uh, usually from 30 to 50, 60, uh, depending on the country. Uh, and this split is uh, usually made by the 50 or 60 hertz, but uh, the data show that it's up to about 60 hertz. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, the 60 to 90 hertz one and above. Maybe there is something above, but uh, with uh, the EGs that I could uh, access, uh, I've been unable to uh, have something more precise uh, about that. But this is uh, repeatable. So uh, the nicest thing, I think, uh, was that uh, I didn't show the picture, I think. Uh, can I steal oh, the yeah, screen? Yeah, you, can share, you can share the... Oh, I I hope I'm not sharing the screen. Um, you should be able no, to no, share no. Um, above yeah, like I... a little uh, computer icon. Yeah, um, one second. Mm -hmm. 
Let's check if this works. So we will have some small inception for a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's what I was uh, showing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to myself, I think. Uh, so that's from my Twitter timeline from the uh, start of the year. So it's not that bad. Uh, that's a component analysis of the frequencies. Uh, on Sampa, this data, uh, data set, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the important thing is it's done on a single person. And the, uh, I think that the most interesting thing is that when you work on a single person, you need to reinvent, reinvent quite a lot of uh, statistics because the, you cannot aggregate uh, in a way in which you're usually doing. Uh, so it, <laughs> it gives you a, a much more rigor to work. And uh, that, that's the approach that I've been always using. Um, and it's, you need more time for that, but it really gives you, uh, gives you back. So uh, this is a correlation analysis of the uh, EEG, and and this is from normal EEG of uh, I think thousand uh, hertz, mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the I'm not okay at least for me, for me you can see the uh, different gammas even in only this one uh, plot. So here you have uh, can you see my mouse? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So here you can see. The first gamma, the low gamma, here you can see uh, the middle gamma, let's say, and this is the, uh, the high gamma. And we can even see that there is more uh, things happening uh, at once. Okay, and so th this, can be, uh, this can be seen for in the, the... For the audience real quick. Um, so yes. the, the x-axis is frequency. Um, it starts yes, at the yes. top at, at zero hertz. So that's like delta. And, um, you know, the, the 34 hertz that you point out to is the first of the, the gammas. Now, in this um, spectrogram, scalagram, the colors represent intensity of activity. Um, what correlation. about oh, correlation? Mm -hmm. So what about the correlation of those two bands jumps out at you? What is the structure? Is it the dark blue section or what what in those bands tells you that there's sort of two clusters? In a second, yes, um, that's. Uh, I will show you this, uh, this great tool for Windows. Uh, okay. So, I hope it will. No, it should color it. Yay! So here we have the first cluster. How do we know that it's a cluster? Uh, because it colorates with different uh, frequencies and by itself uh, it's a uh, cluster. You can find it, of course, with uh, statistical methods, uh, but it's good to know how to read it from uh, just the plot. So, uh, because we have the, here we have our region which is not correlated with uh, the main region, let's say. Did you see your mouse currently? Is it on the uh, screen? No. Oh, yes, it's on different. Uh, it's on different window. Okay. Here it should be much better. Yes. 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 So I will get back to it once more. So, for the the thing that we will usually see is that here we have a region which is highly correlated to itself mm -hmm. and it has some uh, correlations to uh, different regions in, uh, in frequencies. Mm -hmm. Here we have the, let's say, old region where most of the neuroscience happen on EEG. Mm -hmm. Gamma, which correlates with some low frequencies, the old region. And here we have high gammas, uh, which usually correlate only with, uh, in, uh, with single neurons uh, spiking. So this is uh, above 70. Oh, I guess. And I, I cut the uh, the one where the frequency is above 100 hertz, but 
Okay, let's and then to ask the, the layman question then is the red areas at the low end is the stuff that's been well studied, that is well understood to be significant and interesting. And the low you end. About, uh, hmm? You say about the fear? Well, just, just that green circle that you, the first region, the, the green circle with the. Let's make it easy. Yes, for, for one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the, the first one is the, that, that's the old school. And you can see yes. the uh, usual bands, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the, the 0 to 30 hertz stuff. And I've noticed a lot of papers that publish stop at 30 or they stop at 40 because then they don't have to deal with any of the electrical issues. And, you know, or but just a variety. You know why 30? Do you know why it's usually 30? It's no. because uh, no. when uh, people started to produce EEGs uh, and you had uh, low quality, uh, it's really nice to start, nice, let's say. Uh, I didn't want to do that, but here I am having a device. Uh, so w when you are building a device, you learn quite a lot about the history and uh, why people use some components. Yes. yes. In all EEGs, uh, you had to start at 30 hertz to filter at 30 hertz uh, to have a good uh, 50 hertz filter. So it was a usual thing to have a, a button on EEG which will start to destroy your frequencies at 30 hertz. Right. And that's the only thing that stops people at 30 because for most of the time they only had uh, could look at this a portion of the EEG. Now they they didn't have to but like for thir twenty or thirty years. There's no reason for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so the other thing that I believe people, if you look at a power spectrum plot, and I'll I'll actually bring one up later to to give people an example so that they can see you know the drop up. But there's a pretty big drop once you get past sixty hertz. The power in the gamma band gets smaller quite quickly because of the attenuation of the skull. So mm -hmm. I've heard different things um, regarding different consumer BCIs. Most of the consumer EGs go to 256. Some of them go to 300. And I think the, the highest sampling rate by far was the emotive gear, which used to go up to 2000 um, just for something you could buy relatively cheap. And that lets you go up in frequency. But from what I'd heard, you know, anything past 70, 80 hertz was sort of considered unreliable because of the signal loss. But what's what's your take on it? Like, where do you think do you think you can meaningfully measure with yeah. those BC? Yeah, up to 100. Yes, the, 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 there's no problem. OK, that, that's not true. It's there is quite a lot of problems with measuring high, uh, high frequencies because you need to use completely different methods. Like you said, you are unable to use our uh, it's not easy to use amplitudes, uh, which we are all used to, and most of the software is used to. But uh, the correlations are kept, and if you know how to clear the signal, uh, which is our specialty, <laughs> uh, you can use up to 150 hertz uh, from EEG. I'm not saying that you can do it with any consum consumer device, uh, so. If you are, if you keep the skin clean and you have good contact of electron, you need to have a really nice uh, quality uh, of contact uh, for the electron. But if you keep it and somebody is not moving a lot, then it's quite easy to measure uh, even a high gamma. In and it is, it is meaningful, like you can see uh, from many papers. We have seen a yes. lot of response in gamma, and I guess. When we first started collecting data, I was surprised by how much activity I saw in gamma because I, I just had assumed that it was being omitted because it wasn't very interesting. Um, from my personal observations, we've seen some of the most exciting changes in gamma, you know, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, there's changes in delta, there's changes in alpha, there's changes in beta, but like the gamma changes really change. They, uh, they're very responsive and, um, from some of the initial studies we were doing, um, we were looking for which games, we do a lot of esports research, 
so we were trying to look for which games might generate the highest gamma response. The mm. the thing that surprised mm -hmm. me, um, the the game that did, which was a music um, karaoke song where you had to push the buttons in time with the beat of the music. Mm -hmm. So you had to synchronize, you know, the presses that you were doing with what was happening. Anyway, for some reason, like listening to a piece of music and synchronizing to it generated some wonderful game activity for us when we were uh, doing some EG experiments. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah. yeah. You, you are using high, higher gammas because like we can see that there are multiple gammas. We have three gammas here. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually in literature, there are three. Uh, I think that there are at least four um, different gammas. Uh, but, but they are used for a high precision um, intellectual processes, let's say. Right. So uh, the karaoke, where you need to press exact uh, in exact timing, would be a good uh, good place for for seeing gamma. But that's yeah, it may seem that it's a very very good experiment. But with gamma, the most problematic way and why people didn't uh, usually uh, use them is that. You have a ton of artifacts uh, in Gamma. Right. Uh, but now, thanks to the uh, nice computers, and uh, uh, nearly all things like don't use Gamma because there are, there's lots of noise and, uh, and muscle artifacts and things like that. All of these uh, sayings uh, are from, from the past, from the moment when we didn't have <coughs> such a nice uh, software and uh, computing power. Right. Uh, and from the time when we cleared the signal only by eye. And by eye, it's uh, quite hard to, right. uh, it's impossible to see um, low amplitude uh, muscle movements. So it's easy to yeah, see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A few weeks ago, we had a sleep researcher who was explaining that they still score sleep stages by hand. I heard that. Yeah, it, it, it was painful to hear that. Um, it was amazing. I, I, I just, I, it's fascinating to hear that. But yeah, I think a lot of these techniques are, you know, by necessity, that's what was possible 20 years ago. And now sort of by inertia, we just do the same thing. Exactly. It's really good to remember the history. Right. Because uh, we keep to, uh, to repeat things as they were done. And we don't have to. Sometimes it's just that we get to try. We have new software, we have higher precision. Now, it's, uh, um, making a method which allows you to clean the data set uh, in higher frequencies, it's not as hard as it is, used to be. Uh, I'm, I cannot fathom why people score EEG by uh, watching signal. You are unable to see by eye uh, higher frequencies. Right. Even seeing high betas is hard uh, in, uh, in plots. You need to be really good at it. So, and you are unable to see uh, gammas uh, by eye. There is not enough precision in the uh, in the plot. Uh, but it's very easy to do that in sonograms, for example, or things like that. And uh, there, you could score all the EG on the on sonograms or FFTs or how do you want to call them mm -hmm. uh, really easily and uh, in a fast method really in fast pace uh, and if you have a good process for that then you can analyze the gam uh, gammas okay. so it's a little you need a little bit different pipeline but uh, but it works yeah and, and then uh, to go and for yeah. with electro stim um, we, we can try to talk about it some other uh, period later, but starting with the Halo Neuro device a few years ago, which didn't didn't sort of work out long term. Uh, there's a variety of TACS devices that are on the market, and I think TDCS might be coming as well, um, which sort of you know, electro stim insert voltage, mm -hmm. get it out, change some. Um, what's your take on on those and those devices? Um, you have one. I would love to have access to one um, and try them. I, have, I do too many projects at once. 
<laughs> at the moment uh, to try it, but um, ability to uh, push uh, very narrow and concrete frequencies. Mm -hmm. If you have a setup which has uh, multiple electrodes, so you can um, not uh, push a frequency in the whole brain, but try to pinpoint uh, some portion of the brain and stimulate it with uh, precise uh, frequency. For example, one of these gammas, uh, I would like to release it. Uh, there is a lot of uh, work on the analog side because you, uh, to make it uh, to make it work you need to have extreme uh, precision in time right. and right. it's really hard to measure uh, frequency fast enough to then right. push it right. on the same phase because you, yeah. you need to push the frequency on the same phase at, at which it's uh, Working and gammas uh, usually stay up only for small portion of a second, like 15 milliseconds or something like that. And to have a pipeline which allows you to uh, to see that there is gamma happening and you want to boost it, that's a complex task on hardware and software level. Uh, yeah, but that, that should cost a lot, but. It should work. Uh, everything in literature and uh, other places shows that it should work. And we should be able to, to see it. But you need a setup with multiple electrodes which measure and multiple electrodes which uh, stipulate uh, to do it uh, precisely. And I'm waiting for a device like that. Not, not a single electrode, uh, but multiple measurement electrodes and multiple uh, stimulation electrodes. Yeah, I think it's um, one of the big concerns that I heard from a few of the neuroscientists that I asked about that was basically to do with control over the, the voltage. And I do apologize for the drawing. Let's use this. All right, this is someone's head. If there was a good question from... Please, 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 go ahead. Uh, Sukraya, uh, it's not my EEG. That's very important. Uh, I think that this plot was from somebody's data set, uh, but we have the same... Uh, we are now changing the, our specification of our device, so I, I, I will not say that we have the, exactly the same results on our device. That would be uh, too much for the moment. Uh, yeah, one important thing that I didn't say, we presented last year with my company there, but then uh, I, I've catched COVID with my engineer. So for the last year, we didn't do really anything because I had to, we had long COVID both. So yeah, we oh died goodness. for quite a lot of time. <laughs> I, I, want, yeah. I, I don't know if this is intrusive. Have you tried looking at your EEG? Did you see any changes? Because um, Flux I was, was really good on the road. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I've been too stupid to, to do that, and uh, I, I have been able to work only for one hour a day. I'm so, so sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah it was really bad, yeah. <laughs> do, do you feel like it's, um, from what I've read, sorry, let me just sort of back up a little bit. For anyone who hasn't heard about the kernel flow and the kernel flux, uh, these are these two new devices that have FNIRs and EEG, um, and they're super cool, tons of EC money. Uh, yeah. Uh, John Griff, Griffiths from Neurotech Toronto is actually in that program. So he's going to be running experiments using a kernel with his lab. It's so awesome. Okay. So they, uh, let me just find kernel. Uh, oh, yeah. They did this, okay, so in January, back when everyone was still freaking out, but also the neuroscientists, somehow in January, it became okay to talk about long COVID having a neurological component, but I still think that we're too concerned about the fact that the COVID pandemic is happening to kind of talk in full openness about, you know, hey, some percentage of people have neurological effects from COVID and it's yeah, not a they, trivial person. <laughs> yeah, they, they are quite easy to see, let's say. <laughs> I might and, understand. Uh, oh, man. So 
their whole I'm yeah. gonna just share the the Now that you said that, I should have some recordings of myself because I've been testing the, our game for quite a lot of time. So, well, if you <laughs> might, it would be really interesting if you could if you could get a before and after. Um, you would see the changes. So uh, this was. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. That's that's all. This was a an article in a Google Doc that they put out in January 19 um, this year. And they were basically saying that uh, histopathological signs of brain damage were seen post more than 25% of individuals who passed away and were autopsied. Um, it doesn't need to infect the neurons directly, and it has debilitating CNS. Vaccines are on the way. It's, again, back in the thing. But um, cognitive function impairment, even with mild symptoms. The very first sign that I got on the fact that uh, there was a neurological impairment component, you'll have to forgive me for this. Um, yes, blood brain barrier, yes, it crosses through the brain stem. Yeah, absolutely, that's, that's absolutely correct. So when COVID first, uh, this was back in whew, January 20, uh, March 2020, like when they first started disclosing and the borders and all that other stuff. The DOD came out and said that they wouldn't accept anyone to enlist if they'd had COVID. Like, COVID hadn't even spread. And the DOD came out and said, just so you know, if you've had COVID, don't apply to the military. We don't want you. And that really <laughs> concerned people. And the DOD walked it back. And they said, you know what? We're only going to make that restriction if you've been hospitalized with COVID. It's only if you've been hospitalized. But... The fact that that announcement came out that early and it, it was definitive, we definitely don't want you to enlist, um, was very curious, right? So here we are eight months later. Now we're starting to see, oh, there are neurological symptoms long term. So let me just, and I'm sorry to you know talk about it. There was this great uh, fMRI study about, uh, uh, they had an fMRI study before the COVID. Mm -hmm. And they had to test people three years after uh, the study, so that it was posted to, to check how people, uh, how brains age. <clears throat> and so it happens that there was a COVID between uh, the testing. <clears throat> so they had the ability to check uh, how brains shrunk, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, from COVID, and uh, they had very nice and large uh, comparison group. And they said that it was like. Uh, for uh, standard deviation, the, the brains of people after COVID were for standard deviations smaller. Uh, in, in these three years, they shrank for uh, four standard deviations more than uh, people without the COVID. And I'm not saying this about people who were hospitalized. I say it about all the people that had COVID, not long COVID, not hospitalizations, all people. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, there is something, and it, it yeah. The, the one of the uh, facts that sort of recently came out in the news, and this is in the major media, you don't have to wonder whether this is uh, shady knowledge, but basically, the bans on bioweapon research only cover lethal bioweapons. So, bioweapons that are meant to kill are research in them is against the Geneva Convention. Debilitating agents are not in any way outlawed. Things that sicken people, things that uh, debilitate long-term, things that create chronic illnesses, there's no, no rules against it. So this, the sort of understanding is that many countries have been working on debilitating agents for several decades just to sort of get ahead of the game, to understand it and so on. And like why COVID might be debilitating has sort of this interesting, like, oh, because that type of research is allowed, you know, and um, and countries experiment with it. So it is, it is very interesting. So I'll just show this kernel uh, article because this is what they were talking about. This was their sum up on it. Um, so they gave this executive summary, and um, they basically said there's evidence that infection in SARS-CoV-2 can have cognitive and neurological complications, short and long term. Uh, all of these things. And 
this is the one where they kind of don't really know how, um, but ultimately they wanted to. This is this is the part where they kind of pointed out nobody knows how long this stuff is going to last. A, a lot of the information says in twelve to eighteen months things do seem to clear up for many people, um, but I don't I don't think we really have a good handle on it. And I don't think we really understand what exactly is happening because influenza does not cross the blood brain barrier. Influenza does not cause nervous system changes. Influenza does not cause loss of smell. Um, if you if you're able to cause a loss of smell, you are affecting important brain regions. Yeah. <laughs> the smell so, is in the brain. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so if that's the first symptom, it's, if that's one of those symptoms, the loss of it, that tells you that it is, it's interfering with something. Um, that's so if you, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's very personal and certainly I don't, but if you do ever get a chance to look at your EEG data, um, yeah, I, I didn't think about it. But I'm not sure why, but uh, yeah, I think that we try to to check that. It would be very interesting for sure. That is really cool. If I can find the proper data, because I, I've been not very uh, thorough uh, <laughs> with what I was doing at the time. Uh, yeah, and and you so you experience the fogginess and the difficulty. Yeah, I've been uh, an idiot for nine months. <laughs> wow. And it then just gradually started to fade out. Did you have a sleep disturbance? This is the last of the questions that I'll ask you about your sleep. No, I sleep like a baby. For, okay, I've always been Thank you. I was just super curious. <laughs> you know, don't mean to pry into your personal interest. Well, I have, yeah, I, I'm a public person, so <laughs> I have no private life. Great. Great. And so, yeah, from what I understand with the, the stimulation devices, and I'll, I'll go back to the horrible drawing, mm -hmm. um, one of the big questions is like, okay, and here's, here's we're going to do the, the skull and the brain. If we put two electrodes here, you know, one here and one here, it may be that we're hoping that it'll do something like this. And, <coughs> yeah. And target <laughs> sure. the brain. But mm -hmm. what typically tends to happen is that uh, the <clears throat> shortest path might be directly here, or it might even just go along the skin here. Yeah. And so f in addition to having timing sensitivity and voltage sensitivity, uh, it can be difficult to predict whether the current flow is going to go where you're hoping it can go. Uh, how, do, how do TACS devices or how do electrostim devices try to handle that issue? The, the, uh, some devices are uh, it's very really important where you place the electrodes if you put electrodes which are near to each, each, uh, each of them so the okay. shortest path uh, on the skin is not uh, much uh, it's similar in length than the path through the brain it will nearly always go through the uh, through the skin right uh, so the, the, the placement of the electrodes so mm -hmm. to make it as hard as it is possible uh, to go over the skin is uh, quite uh, important. Mm -hmm. But the, the second thing that we should do is to measure, uh, to have at the same time measurement electrodes and uh, electrodes interesting the, the, the electricity to check if we are conducting in only on the skin or not. But this is a really hard problem and, and you have the same problem in the EEG. Uh, even in normal EEG, because the uh, one of the greatest findings for me, uh, at least, uh, when I started to, to build the EEG, was that the ground electrode is not a ground electrode, uh, and ground yeah, it's, it's completely it's a bias electrode that's for some reason called ground, which is something ex completely different and in different places in EEGs, and the bias electrode is. Uh, uh, pushing the electricity on the uh, on the person, and if you uh, place it uh, in uh, in a wrong way, it has the same problem. So if you don't uh, put the gas electrode properly, uh, it's too near to uh, well, some electrodes, etc. Then you will create the same uh, the same problem. You will not uh, change. Uh, what we are measuring in the proper way, 
uh, you can create disturbances not uh, and not help yourself to, to have a better quality of the signal. So EEG is a very, very old uh, device and it wasn't changed for nearly a hundred years now. But we have 90 years of nearly the same, uh, maybe 70 or 60, for, let's say for 60 years, there are no changes in its uh, in how it's built. Uh, there's so much that could be improved on many levels. Uh, for the st stimulation, you could use stimulation even to check on different electrodes uh, how they change the brain, how the brain works and interacts, to check uh, the quality of the signal or the clouds. You could vastly improve EEG as a device uh, if it was a closed loop system uh, that can uh, push and pull uh, the signal, let's say. Right. And if we, uh, as long as we will keep to do uh, transcranial direct uh, stimulation only by uh, pushing some frequencies and checking if behaviorally something changed, I don't think that it will work properly. We need to uh, do a much more thorough uh, work. There's much more yeah. to do. What, That's why this? I found that paper mm -hmm. from UCSF so exciting is because it was actually measurement based, right? Let's let's get the yes, patient, yes. let's identify Wait, this is the exact thing. Oh sorry. No, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so it was great. I, I just thought that was amazing that it was personalized medicine for that person and that that's the that's the right way. That if we're if we're doing that, if we're measuring pre post and you know stimulus then then we're really confident in what we're doing um what what is your feel on the difference between tvcs and tacs sorry go ahead i have none i'm not good enough i don't have enough knowledge to to, to say more okay. <laughs> about them sure. i would just get back to the uh to this single person measurement for a second yes uh, i think that if we cannot uh measure something on a single person uh, on a few trials and repeat that if our method is not good enough to see uh, differences in experiment on a single person, then we, we are not doing it correctly. Uh, and this thinking changes a lot. How do you do the experiments? How do you do statistics and things like that? It, it's harder, but uh, I don't think that we will go uh, much further without uh, changing the approach to the single person approach. And that's I why I agree, agree more. Love this paper. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think, uh, oh yeah, uh, direct stimulation against TMS in terms of performance. Oh, from what I know, uh, transcranial stimulation is much, much better. Uh, I'm always scared when I see papers about uh, TMSs because it's like uh, giving somebody a, a psychotropic drug which is extremely potent and uh, short-lived. And we are giving it like uh, MMMs to people. Yeah, just turn off this part of the brain. For sure, nothing bad will happen. Uh, I'm partially scared about the, this device. It's uh, one of the most powerful devices that we have at the moment for neuroscience. I'm not sure why, why it's not used more, uh, more often or for in clinical uh, settings. That's unknown to me. I've also heard some surprisingly powerful effects from focused ultrasound. Um, targeting specific brain regions with focused ultrasound does allow them to do the exact same thing we're talking about, knock out regions for a period of time. Um, and I had the same reaction, which was just like, how, uh, how comfortable are we doing this? Um, I casually had this conversation with someone like, yeah, sometimes when you hit people with the focused ultrasound, you know, for a few days afterwards, they lose their like um, inner monologue. And I'm just like, what, how, is that really something we can casually just, hey, yeah, I hit this brain region and you lose your internal, man, I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed by the power of it. And I'm also like, geez, I hope nobody zaps me with one of those because that would be unpleasant. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I think that we are just slowly getting to understand how much power we have in these devices. Uh, and yeah, with ultrasound, we can very precisely target uh, inner brain regions of, of very small size. And we, if we would understand better <laughs> how the brain works, uh, or put a little bit more time to test them, I, I hope that we won't do that uh, on people because it will, you could do even a machine learning task when, where the device is going through all the regions right. with intervals and check what's, uh, what differences do you have on the EEG, for example, or something like that, how their performance changes on, uh, on the behavioral tasks mm -hmm. and map it quite fast, but it's extremely <laughs> dangerous to do such a thing. Uh, it does. It, it, powerful and dangerous. I, I think yeah. that at some point, I understand this level of public interest in BCIs, and I understand a lot of these questions that we get because we are well ahead. We're not at that sci-fi future where we can read people's thoughts and know what's going on or whatever. But I do. No, no, I'm sure you're something. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, kind of. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving the the, the yeah, nice yeah. version of it, right? But we're getting really close to the idea that you won't be able to hide your reactions or your feelings. I need to show you something. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. let, let me. It's in Polish, so I'm really sorry. Uh, oh, no, that's fine. If you can just explain what we're looking at, I'm, I'm happy to check yeah. it out. So one of the things that I'm doing, like I said, I'm in 100 projects at once, mm -hmm. uh, is this. So uh, we make, I've cut the video of the person, so yeah. Uh, this is a setup for um, UX study of a game. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice game in Kulinati. Uh, it's like a chess, but fun. Okay. Uh, but they ask us what they can improve, what they should change. Uh, and this is the uh, um, short part of the one and a half hour recording. Mm -hmm. um, so you should uh, look at uh, this, we call it a snake plot, uh, mm -hmm. because it just looks like some kind of snake or bug. Bug is not as pleasant, so we rename it to a snake. Um, was it the bug plot before? Yes, it was a bug plot, but people okay. said to me that it, it doesn't sound that nice. So, yeah, okay. okay, no, no, snake, I'm with it. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what it's uh, what is it showing? It's showing uh, when it's going on left, like now, it's avoidance, and uh, avoidance is when you uh, don't understand something, uh, you are surprised, or there is something unpleasant. Uh, and I'm I will repeat it every single time because uh, if you read neuroscientific literature, they've lost half of the theory when they changed from uh, behavioral science uh, and animal neuroscience when, uh, and they switched to uh, human neuroscience, they've, they've lost the part about the surprise and not understanding. Okay. So they only left the unpleasant uh, part. And this is a very, very large uh, difference. Because if you have surprise and uh, uh, not understanding, then, then you have more, uh, the, the process is more like an attention, a specific type of attention uh, which have a sign. So it, it says that something is important, you need to put uh, an effort uh, on it, but it says if it can be dangerous or not. So this is what we are saying. Let's think about it like uh, we are watching a uh, golden fish, some, some primitive organism, because this is the level on which we are, uh, let's say, recording. So on the left, we have something unpleasant or uh, surprising. On the right, we have something interesting. There is, uh, if we go on the right, there is exploration, creating an idea, or uh, trying to hit something. Uh, and the, yeah, let's keep it at that. If uh, the snake is up, that means that the brain is uh, highly powered. That's not a very good word, I'm sorry. So it, uh, um, 
yeah, it, the brain is very active, and when it's uh, down, it's in apathy. There, just nothing is happening. The, the, we have the, if people get uh, on the black side, it means that they are not thinking at the moment. They have a blank, uh, blank state of the of the mind, and uh, this state happens when you do extremely repetitive things. So your brain brain is not doing any higher higher uh, mental uh, computing, let's say. Or when you are meditating, when you are uh, concentrated on very very small uh, amount of your brain, and the rest of it is, uh, let's say, at sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a part where we asked a question about the uh, if this person will uh, buy the game and what price it should have. Uh, <clears throat> that's why it's uh, interesting. So for the start. Uh, the guy had a problem to to think about anything. That's why he and we can see that uh, he has problem with creating any idea because he he stays uh, stays low, and mm -hmm. unable mm -hmm. to uh, to say anything new. So uh, and it it works both ways. So if you are in this state uh, of the apathy, it's really hard to create any idea and if you are for example um, even sleep a lot or something like that and you 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 will see that somebody speaks they have an idea then the uh, the snake plot goes down and it means that you lost like your uh, attentional energy or something but that's not proper wording but let's say you are, uh, you lose your train of thought and uh, the snake is going down. So you, you can see on this plot before uh, somebody loses the, the track of their uh, of their idea uh, that they will be unable to to say anything and continue to speak. Right. Um, and here he is trying to create something to, to, to say the price and fighting to not uh, to don't that, do that and here he's saying that the game should cost uh, the equivalent of uh, twelve dollars. Right. Uh, right. That he could pay, and that's it. because the the game was not uh, not ready. Uh, every person that we've asked had the same kind of reaction, where they made a circle on the left when they said that they would pay this twelve dollars. Uh, and it repeats in every uh, in every test that we do that when people when they are not happy enough with something, they will say that yes, you could pay that, but when they are thinking about themselves spending that money, they are going into aversion. And yeah, when they imagine it, like, it's not a pleasant mm -hmm. thing that they're picking. Yes. Yes, exactly. And you can see it kind of on their faces. And, and we knew that they will do that because we knew that how much they liked the, uh, the gameplay. And the only moment when they go a little bit on right is when they say that if they will add some uh, new features to the, uh, to the game. Yeah. Hello, this is Yoda. Uh, features to the <laughs> gameplay. Uh, then maybe they will. Uh, it will be better. And the, the most, the, it, it's fun, a fun thing. But because it repeats every time, it's important. And uh, on when I was last time speak, I am uh, was asking Brian, I think, uh, oh, was Brian, asking yeah. me about the uh, money uh, about this plot. Um, what the, Okay, I will read that in a second. Uh, Brian asked me about this plot and he said that it looks like a manifold, uh, kinda. Uh, but but I, because of him, I started to uh, if it is a, if it is a manifold, then we should see at, uh, attractors and the patterns which uh, the snake is making, like circles or things like that, could mean something. Mm -hmm. uh, so just after uh, I, I spoke with. Uh, Brian we started doing these game tests, and yes, th there are patterns which are com repeatable uh, multiple times in uh, even a single session. And when Snake is doing uh, 
uh, a circle, which means just that his uh, our brain is uh, getting into the same attractor. So activity of the brain is staying in a, in a new, in single place for a longer time, and longer time is around uh, two seconds window. It means that we are creating an idea, and it can be a negative idea, like I would not spend that amount of money. Or it can be a positive when people are making a strategy between, before a move. You, you can see the same, and this, these are usually the most pleasant uh, things for them uh, in a game where they are making a strategy before uh, doing something, and you can see that beforehand on the on the plot. So you can uh, watch people on very uh, in very precise manner. You know when they lie. Uh, if they allow you, because if they would like to hide it, it's not very hard. They just need to think about something else. But the uh, the precision of that measurement is good enough to see even a, your reaction to even a part of a sentence. Mm -hmm. So amount of things that we can read from people, even now, is quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a very interesting experiment done on this. I mean, this was a synthetic experiment, so it wasn't real. But they did a mock-up. Anyway, they had a suspect who had been at the crime scene. And they have him in an EEG. And the idea is, you know, there's a set of photos that have been published. And everyone has seen those. And everyone's going to respond, right? Whatever was in the papers on the crime scene or whatever. But if you show someone a hidden photo that wasn't in the papers, and people have one of two reactions when they see a photograph, either like indifference or recognition. And mm -hmm. you wouldn't recognize a place you had never been. But if you saw a photo of the crime scene at the night yeah, and nice. you did recognize it, you know, well, gee, why do you recognize that? So that, I mean, that test was done. And then another experiment I believe that they did was they had people think about going to a destination, but they divided the group into two parts. And they said, one of you is taking a vacation. The other is planning like an attack on this thing. And then they wanted to see like, okay, when we present the photos, can we distinguish between the two groups? Once again, yes, like there is some sort of difference between planning a vacation and doing something else. So that's what I mean. Like this, we're getting closer and closer to being able to sort of ask very specific questions and that people can't really be deceitful about their answer. And I do think that that is a new thing. Like. We had a hint of that with polygraphs, but even the people doing them knew that they were unreliable. I think that this is good and bad. You know, if it, we will be able to uh, understand people. Yeah, about sorry. the polygraphs, we, have to, the, we will always have the same problem. Even if we have, we will have the perfect machine that will read our thoughts. Right. Uh, if you choose to think about something else, you can lie. Right. You just right. need to uh, know that you're measured and right. choose to change how you think. And that, that's so, all. So, so, so that the primary the thing you're thinking works. about is something that doesn't stress you out? Is that is that how it works? Uh, once you, you could repeat, sorry. So when you're saying think about something else, um, mm -hmm. you mean like um, try to think about something more intensely than the question yes. that you're answering? Okay. So if like you a will, for example, you took or something. Mm -hmm. If you imagine something, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or concentrate mm -hmm. on some visualization and try to speak uh, when you have this visualization, we'll, we'll be unable to know that we are joining these two uh, ideas and which of them is more uh, is stronger. Uh, and it's clearly seen in every research that we have done in, over the years that, for example, we cannot do any research near to doors, coffee machines, or anything. Any sound or smell or even movement on the, new to your head is destroying results that we have because, uh, okay, we don't remember these uh, sounds, but they are... Yeah, that's uh, you that chair. It isn't for accuracy of measurement. It's so you can't move around too much. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so, now it makes a lot more sense. Yes, so everything that... Uh, we are paying attention to every small detail because uh, our brains are made to survive on savanna where somebody could, would like to uh, eat us. Right. And uh, you can see that in the brain recordings. 
everything is more interesting than, for example, ads that we are showing to a person or the dialogue that somebody is reading. Uh, for example, when we are uh, starting to talk with somebody, uh, their emotional reactions are usually two or three times higher, mm -hmm. more, more intense than when they are watching materials. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's lots of things that are much more interesting for our brain than what we think uh, or ask people about. Right. That's really cool. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I've spent years watching these uh, videos and it's fascinating to see people on a such a uh, short time scale and what you can learn about how our attention and emotions work. Uh, yeah. Supriya had an excellent question about uh, autism. Is that an area that you've looked into? No, we know that we could, but we don't have uh, enough uh, time or financial means to, uh, to take something. We know that it should help, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. to, to do that, we need to. We, we cannot promise something to people with autism or their right. parents, uh, because we didn't do their research, and this research would be quite uh, cumbersome and expensive, and we are just unable. We've asked some researchers if they want mm -hmm. to try, but mm -hmm. for them also this is a quite a lot of uh, extra work uh, from the manual. Mm -hmm. yeah. We know that it should, in theory, help, but yeah. So, um, that's a really cool topic that you bring up, Supriya, because it, it's something I've been looking into as well. So we have this, um, we use that, you, you've seen the video that I shared with the eye tracker and the circle and the fixations here. I'll, um, I'll show real quick, um, I don't think I'm sharing. But the thing is, I'm pretty sure we have a good autism biomarker already and um, that it would also be similar to ADHD, um, but Oh, uh, I don't think that uh, Supreya asked about the biomarker. Oh, uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. but for di diagnosing, right. Okay. So there is one thing that I think is pretty cool for like a diagnostic thing, but then again, you know, do we have the resources for it? I don't think so. Um, but I just, I picked a random video that we did um, where we collected stuff and I just wanted to huh? show you like the, the way that, all right, drive is being awful. So one of the things that we did see in some of the subjects, oh goodness, all right, I guess the 720 work. Nope. I'm gonna do this, 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 this. I don't understand why this keeps breaking. Oh my God. Cool. Okay, so the fixations, people, um, we use eye trackers. Now for what we're doing, you know, someone needs to actually be physically present at a location that we have. But if you remember last week when I was talking about the HP Omnicep G2, this is something you could absolutely start calculating and tracking, which is um, if you look at the way people's gaze, the, the eyes look around the screen. By the way, you can, you can see my screen in the videos, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, when they lock onto a target, let's see if we can find something, or when they stay in one region, you're gonna get what's called like a fixation, great. So this chicken is of interest, and basically the person was looking around before, but now we're starting a fixation that's gonna last you know, up to like a few seconds, it probably won't be that long, but during the time that he's aiming at the chicken, all right, so that chicken got, but looking down the hallway, we had a lengthy one. We had like a one second fixation right down the middle of it. Um, okay, here we go, here's a target. We're gonna get some longer fixations now that we're in a fight. Uh, but yeah, basically, the, the main thing I wanted to show is that this fixation pattern can really be a good diagnostic tool for a lot of things, and it really isn't used widely. So in terms of like autism diagnoses, I think that in a year or two, you could put a widely released VR device on someone that you suspect has either ADHD or autism and get like a pretty decent idea of whether it's worth testing and, and following up on. 
So I think that that would be pretty fascinating. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to make any strong claims. From what I've seen, there's a big difference between like a normal fixation pattern and a divergent fixation pattern, whatever it is that uh, the people talk about. And it really seemed to me, uh, oh, Nathan, awesome from, from the lab. It really seems to me like the fixations for people with autism tend to stop shorter. Like um, that. I tend to work for, for a short duration of time in a research lab, which uh, tries to use eye tracking for disturbing uh, social economical differences in small children. And the same group uh, did also the autism uh, research. And uh, it's not that easy, but it, it seems that it's possible. Uh, you cannot find it just from uh, fixations alone. You need to know of, uh, at, uh, at what people were uh, looking at. So what you need context. to... Uh, yeah. That, that's the most, most important. I mean, without context, no method, will, nearly no method will work. So we, we need to know uh, what people are looking at. And decided. So, yeah, th there is a, quite a lot of potential in uh, eye tracking also. Yeah, we were using eye tracking with our research for quite a long time. But. Yes, uh, okay. yes. saccades, uh, fixations, and like the characteristics of the movement. I do think that if you cluster them right, you can come up with a profile of like, you know, here is a person that doesn't have ADHD, and here's a person that does. Um, and that there are some differences that can be measured in the eye tracker. That is so cool to. Do I have any data on the differences in fixations? No. Um, we've had a couple of people come through that told us they have ADHD, but we don't, we're just looking at esports performance. And so we don't really like dig into their medical history. We're not trying to pry. We're just trying to understand, you know, okay, how do you do in the game? Um, but we did see- There are open and very large data sets which uh, show these uh, differences. Uh, okay, well, let's see if we can find at least in I'm, Evo, uh, I, I'm very bad at names, so I, I won't help you. That's why I studied uh, neuroscience. I wanted to know why I cannot remember names. Uh, so there are very, very large projects with thousands of uh, people where they make EEG and eye tracking research. Uh, on children, uh, mm -hmm. what I know, usually, uh, to check these differences. But yeah, that I would really like to see that. So first off, I think it's great that we have the the EEG data from from this particular experiment that we just talked about, the paper that got studied. I would love to get some of these, and you know, we we have a pipeline that processes a lot of eye movements, characterizes them, profiles them, etc. So it would be neat to see, if, you know, if I can find one of those data sets, I'd be happy to run it and take a look what the differences look like. But Sort of the. Are you using your own software for fixations or uh, the top one? Well, no, we, we, we wrote our all of our own um, algorithms. So we wrote our own method of detecting saccades and the speeds that they have. Then we had our own method of detecting fixations and calculating their speeds. And then we came up with a method for a smooth pursuit in their speeds. So we kind of came up with this uh -huh. complicated ratio threshold based system that actually seemed to work better than a lot of the other stuff we were doing. So um, seemed yeah. to seem to really help. Yeah, I've played out a little bit of uh, attractive research and I, I found that the software from uh, Toby and uh, SMI is just if you want to use the, their software for analyzing uh, fixations, it's really bad because they are not working with uh, outliers. Uh, noise, they are not. They have no correction for noise. But not a lot. Let's say a correction for noise. They have no uh, algorithms or working with outliers. So you should not work with their software if you want to make a research. No, and actually, I think the right answer is ultimately this thing would be kind of self-tuning a little bit because people's eye movements are kind of different. Um, yeah. But the but the Toby software doesn't give you a lot of calculations. It just gives you some values, which is great. Like if you the, just want people, the scientific to one gives you uh, yeah everything. It depends on what the license you're doing. Yeah, we have the we have the the pro license. But to answer right, 
we had to write our own profiler for all of those things because we wanted fine grain control over the, the eye movements. And the thing is like, when calculating fixations, the method Toby uses is sort of like a proximity within time type of thing. So like if the sample isn't more than a certain distance apart from the previous sample, um, but we got a little, the thing is, depending on the application, you might have fixations that tend to be longer or shorter. So I think um, what we found was that really you could kind of tune fixations one of three ways, like to be as precise as possible, but to lose some, to have kind of a nice in between or to make sure you catch every fixation, even if it's wrong. Toby kind of tuned for that one because they were going for the Windows hello experience and they wanted you to be able to click on things with your fixation. So the way they made it work is that it would take way, way longer, but it would be like more reliable. So yeah, we had to write our own and then we tested various thresholds and then we found kind of like a sweet spot for us, which is a little more aggressive than Toby, but much more precise. Mm -hmm. So, but that's a, I can see you use their gear because you're familiar with that part of it. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, sorry, if you were gonna say something. Yeah, I've worked on the research grade uh, eye trackers from different companies uh, and compared them. So, so I do think it's great that the, the other tests, the more dedicated tests require, you know, you, you go into a clinic, you get an assessment. And one of the things that we did hear from Toby is that it's hard to get students in a research facility. They, they have the most success with all of this gear if they can get it in a school, if they can get it in a place where subjects actually are instead of having them come to the to the specific location so i really do think i mean one has to be very careful with these claims and i think that's why nobody is making them but i do believe that in a year or two when we have far more eye tracking devices that that are vr integrated that have that data stream like hp omnicept g2 that we're going to find that there's a generic method where we can sort of say you might be a good candidate for testing type of thing, right? So we're not saying one way or the other, but we're saying you you might, you know, show signs or whatever. So I guess one really wonders, you know, do who, what would be the diagnostic procedure? But right, if a family could just buy or borrow a VR device, get an app of some sort and get like a good start without having to go travel to some specialty location and, and do a bunch of in-person tests, I really think that that would be an amazing thing. I think that would help a lot. I'm waiting until our cameras in the computers and phones will have 60 hertz and we will be able to make eye trackers from them. And it, they will be not of the extremely good quality, but they should be good enough uh, to, to judge things like that. Uh, if you prepare a special, let's say, game uh, for somebody, if you create a um, uh, game that will engage a child and it has uh, and it's behind the scenes, it's testing, uh, it's uh, fixations on different kinds of objects, uh, different features, facial features, things like that. You should be able to create the generic uh, application that will be extremely cheap and done with uh, computer camera. You don't yes. need that much yes. precision. Let me show you, uh, this is Achilles software that they don't have a way to track your fixations. But the game forces you to fixate for two or three seconds if you want to like succeed at the game. In other words, you know, you're going to have to look at the object. So it starts training children with ADHD to like um, get used to these longer fixations. And I think that they were saying that they're already seeing results, and that's without. So it got FDA approval for treatment of ADHD, which I believe is the first digital therapeutic that yeah. got approved, but they don't have a way to monitor. They don't have a way to prove, and yet it still works. So I think that that's amazing. But just like you were saying, once the iPad has an eye tracker equivalent built in, or once your laptop has an eye tracker equivalent built in, then we can take it to the next level and know for sure what you're looking at, you know, when, uh, when you're You don't need even eye trackers. You just need to... Uh, two cameras or right. a better right. camera. Because in, on, on the computer, you have, um, if you have a game like that uh, and you have a camera, mm -hmm. you know exactly mm -hmm. where you are showing things and you can calibrate uh, in time, let's say, 
not you don't need to make a calibration before, but because you are controlling what's shown uh, and uh, measuring at the same time, you can calibrate through the whole uh, experiment, let's say. So th th there are ways. <laughs> uh, you don't need special software. You don't need large uh, changes. Uh, a good HD camera and 60 hertz. Uh, yeah, it's enough for that. That is super cool. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm very excited. And what I'm imagining is if someone combined your approach with an eye tracker and some students. Oh, we did that. Research, I think that'd be very fascinating. So how how were the results? What did you find? So uh, the nice thing is that we were using eye tracking for past six years with our method. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not showing it because it's not uh, applicable. We will not give eye tracker with our headbands, so there's no point in uh, in combining them. But right. beforehand, we did. Uh, we started with neural marketing research, which I don't mm -hmm. like, uh, but it was a way for uh, for me to uh, get a cash to. Uh, make a little bit more of science, and I think that it's a good thing to take money from corporations to make science. Uh, so uh, we've combined a tracking with our device, and because we have this precision of around 200 milliseconds, we are able to uh, combine eye tracking and exact fixations with exact reactions. Right. Um, it's fun uh, when you you are able to make uh, heat maps, uh, which uh, show you, uh, for example, in uh, UI uh, research, uh, mm -hmm. when you are using only an eye tracker, uh, people say that the things at which you look are good uh, because people have seen them. And what, what <laughs> the first finding that we had when we joined the methods was that, yeah, not really. Because people usually spend the most time looking at things that they don't understand. So many buttons and things like that. <clears throat> they usually, if they spend lots of time on them, it means that they don't understand what they are doing and they are just searching and trying to find the proper button or something. And they are angry, not happy. Okay, so I have like a one minute response to that. I got in on a Toby um, just marketing. No, not, not Toby, I'm sorry. Um, iMotions. It was an iMotions <laughs> webinar, and they were talking about marketing, research, eye trackers, and whatever. So I was really interested. Okay, you know, I know neuromarketers use eye trackers. What are their metrics, and how do they determine it's of interest? Right. I, I, this was the mystery. Like, I, I know how I use an eye tracker. How do they use the eye tracker? The answer is the first thing you look at, or the thing you spend the most time looking at. That's it. Those are their only two criteria. <laughs> And I'm like, I, I mean, that's one way of measuring it. But really, how do we know that? It, just like you're saying, how do we know you don't hate it? And you're just like looking at it like, oh, what is this? You know, or or you know, how do we know that this is a good thing? That's I was waiting the whole time for like, and this is why we know it's important. Mm -mm, that far didn't didn't arrive. No, and you have no, but you have no way to without. Uh, device like EEG, you, are, you have no way to uh, right. check in that. Uh, I made one of the largest uh, eye tracking studies in Europe, to my knowledge, on uh, 600 people, I think. Wow. wow. Uh, and, and we used, um, in the first portion, we had uh, not only eye, we had eye tracking, but we had eye tracking with, uh, with pupil, pupil dial telemetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people on so, yeah, people that are uh, We've used three, uh, three informations, how many fixations you have on an object, uh, how long are those uh, fixations usually, and what's the focal diametry. And when you have these three different uh, things at once, and if they are properly cleared, uh, there was a shit ton of work to, yeah. It was complicated. Yeah, the but, data cleaning and prepping that we've had to do on our own studies is incredible. <laughs> it, it takes a lot of time and it, it's not like it's uh, everywhere in the literature because when you are going from nice experiment to uh, real world uh, data, not in force, so it's true. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we yeah. did some like three hour studies and, you know, anyway, it just, yeah. you, you have to but, get familiar with the problems. When you have these three informations, you can 
uh, discern types of material, how important they are for people. Uh, but even with all of that data, uh, you're unable to know if they were they spent that much of a time because they were angry of the ad, right. but they read it because it was so blasphemous, let's say, right. or because it was so interesting and nice. You, you are unable to check that without external data. And uh, having even um, a face reader is not helping you because people, uh, um, you will see something on the face reader only in a situation where you have very uh, high amount of emotions and they are very strong. Mm -hmm. And that happens not that often. Now, they did have one interesting piece of information that sort of like was the only valuable part from their whole presentation, which was a company in Switzerland hired them mm -hmm. to research whether um, something about their packaging. They wanted to figure out, you know, how would this go or whatever. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to standardize their packaging for all of Europe so that they just printed like six different languages on the thing. Anyway, um, what they did find was that the presence of another language like frustrated the consumers be for like whatever reason, because like they would just jump back and forth between the two, you know, and whatever, and like not being able to read it, even though they kind of knew what was there because it was in every language, was sort of um, not attractive to them. It wasn't desirable to them. So I think that that's an interesting one where, where I do think it's valid. I do think that, um, you know, if I was looking at a wrapper with something on it, I would be a little wondering, like, what does this say? Or, you know, why didn't they just make the packaging for here? There's like a few things that you wonder about. And I, I thought that that was an interesting finding. So the way that they described it is if there's something confusing or unsightly um, on the product, it's going to make you like it less, which I think does kind of go to your aversion type processing uh does that yeah. seem consistent with what you see yes if you are uh, confused you will jump more uh, right. between right. but it's always context dependent the, the thing that we we've we learned over the years is everything is so much it, it, the, the more precision because our precision was changing in time right, uh, right. the more precision you have the, the more you can see that everything is context dependent and how much that you can even see uh, the personality differences. That people with different personalities interact completely differently to the same things. Uh, your past matters. If you are, uh, you ride cars and you like them, you will react differently to them in the, even the, some simple movie which is about something else. There, uh, every noise in the place, every noise in the uh, art, film, game, etc. Every camera change, uh, button not correctly, not tracking correctly. Very, very small differences, and uh, your past uh, changes how you react. And you can see it's, uh, <laughs> it makes the, the research harder. Uh, it was not obvious for me, but the, the more precision you have, the, the harder is the research because you have more informations like that, and then you can need to somehow integrate all of that. Yeah, yeah. We found both of those things. The higher the precision of the device, the harder it is to use and interpret the data. Although eventually, when you get over it, you end up with much higher quality, whatever. Right, but getting there is harder. And then the more sensors you're trying to integrate and correlate, again, w when you get there and when you have the whole context map and you have all the the responses, then it's wonderful. Then you have this rich picture and it's great. But getting there can take months, you know, to try to understand. And how do you integrate the data and the different? It just it's incredible how as you stack it, it, it gets pretty tough to to aggregate. Yeah, yeah. We've spent twelve years now on the research that we are doing. Uh, and if you have seen the uh, the snake or the hydra plot, which was uh, the myth, uh, you have um, 12, no, 24 indicators there, I think, mm -hmm. at once, mm -hmm. in time. So yes, there is a lot of information on the on this uh, on the single plot, and we are using only a very very tiny portion of. Uh, of the information that we have, because we found that uh, we have more indicators, but uh, we found that 
nobody is able to read all of them. People have problems reading even the, the single uh, snake. So we have 27 different uh, different indicators, which are uh, which have the same statistical properties as the ones that we are using currently. Uh, but we are even not researching them because there is no time or purpose for that. We have, we have problems with uh, showing what these two uh, main indicators are doing, and yeah, we will wait for a better time uh, to check uh, others. Okay, so oh, yes. a few questions from Tony that I think would be really fun to get to. Also, if anyone else wants to chime in, join us on stage, have some comments, please let us know because uh, we have two more slots on the thing. Lovely discussion. Thank you so much. Episodic memory. Uh, is there any evidence of downloading or copying a specific episodic memory and using and the ability of using that memory to show that another person or the same or another body or the same body can recognize that memory, or I guess another person or the same person. So sort of like, have we found the, the, the stuff that memories are contained in and do we have a way to Kinda. measure and transfer? Kinda, and this research was done 15 years ago. So 15 mm -hmm. years ago, we had research on mouses, of course, uh, on uh, hippocampus, uh, where I, of course, don't remember the name of the researcher, I'm sorry. Uh, that was some guy from MIT, and I found him on the conference for IBM. Uh, so maybe that will help somebody. Uh, he was um, doing collisions. Uh, so he uh, did put electrodes uh, in the hippocampus under the, let's say, now the entrance and the end of the hippocampus, whatever it is. Uh, you can, you should be able to read it in, uh, in the paper. And after long enough sessions of recording, he was able to cut the connections in hippocampus uh, and uh, through stimulation recreate the memories. So uh, he was able to heal, uh, heal the hippocampus, uh, uh, recreate the function of the legend that he created in hippocampus and uh, restore the, the function of hippocampus. Uh, to uh, machine learning model, uh, which mapped the uh, activity on the interest for the hippocampus and uh, the end. So it um, means uh, exactly that we are able to uh, recreate numbers. It doesn't mean that we know what we are doing, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but it means that in the same animal, we are able to do that. So the so, lesioning, really quick, just to, for, for people that are unfamiliar, Neuroscientists try to study the brain by turning parts of it off and seeing what happens. Um, now, you could do this in many, many, many ways, uh, but like, is that what you're referring to? Sort of cutting the. the they cut the connection. It was even simpler. They just cut connections between uh, two parts of the hippocampus. Uh, so, yeah, that, oh, yeah, it sounds like that's what. They got the, the mouse hit the campus and then use stimulation to recreate those memories. Uh, it was 15 years ago. Uh, the research is going really, uh, really well. They are trying to create a, uh, how do call it? Theodore okay, Berger I've, I've lost the word. I'm sorry. Uh, someone in chat said Theodore Berger at USC. Yeah, probably, yes. Uh, I would guess that the guy from the kernel was trying to work on his uh, on his story before he started kernel, uh, but uh, he chose to not because it's not uh, ready enough to uh, to use on humans. And the idea for this device was to restore memories in people with white scan or something like that. Yay! Great. That's amazing. Uh, Josh, would, uh, not to put you nice spot, but if you would be open to uh, joining us for next week or whatever, um, I would love to hear about your experiences or anything like that. But it's totally OK <laughs> if, you, if you'd rather just enjoy from, uh, from the audience as well. That would be nice to hear. Yes. All right. Well, it should prompt you in a moment, 
and then we can see whether that's working. Okay. Okay, great question from Ibrahim. Inflammation and O2 concentration around the eyes is a measure of attention, mood, strength of memory. Um, for eyes, um, the movement and size of them is currently measured. And if we're talking about measuring oxygenation in the brain, which is what F mirrors, uh, functional mirror infrared yeah, spectroscopy does, um, it actually measures the oxygenation of the brain, which allows you to infer the resource usage of the brain. So as the brain consumes more, um, it needs more oxygen. So that tells you that that brain region is working because the color of the, the blood flow changes because of the oxygenation changes. I'm sorry. The oxygenation changes. So um, on top of that, you look at expression, like gesture. Um, and then you can look at things like skin temperature. Um, you can look at galvanic skin response. So like uh, that's like your skin conductivity. That's what the polygraph measures. So those are the types of things that are currently used um, to measure like, ah, okay, Josh, no worries. Um, sorry if it's a little uh, fiddly. It might work in a different browser, but we'll just, uh, we'll just talk about some other stuff. If you get it working, you can join us on stage. And if it doesn't work, no worries. Uh, thanks, thanks for being game to, uh, to give it a shot. Um, but yeah, there was a really neat demo from uh, see, Systems. The uh, Ram Moffitt has a new startup, and they use the System 2 Neurosciences. Okay. okay. So go ahead and share. And yeah, this is what you can do with FNIR's EG. So they had this demo that they put together, VR Racing. Um, here is your EEG type stuff. So you got your powers and your brain regions. You've got the power spectrum. Hope I'm sharing the screen. Can you guys see this? Or did I forget to share? No, I am sure. Cool. So yeah, so, this is yeah. Uh, on the bottom right is your F nears tracking okay. the blood flow, and you can see the regions and how the flow is changing. So yeah, the big innovation here is that it's a device that goes right with their VR and so on. You get the EEG electrodes and you get the FNIRs so you can look at the blood flow. So yeah, inside the brain, you can use blood flow to, um, to look at use of cognitive resources. Um, and I think that those are for the most part, so it's going to be a mix of, you know, skin temperature, skin conductivity and expression tells me how you feel about something. Um, your eyes tell people how long you look at something and then like your EEG and your FNIRs can tell like how your brain is working to process that. I'm interested in how they will correlate the FNIRs with EEG as they have completely different uh, time scales and so latentions and things like that. Uh, it's of course possible, but there's quite a lot of work on this uh, on this part. I think you'd be able to I make force comparisons. Yeah, yeah but the, the uh, time scale is so different between EEG and uh, FNIRS uh, that they show completely different processes. You can uh, see the same processes in EEG, but I didn't see too much research on it uh, to use EEG for such a long uh, time scale. And it's not, let's say, that easy uh, to jump uh, from the usual time scale to the, the one which is similar to the FDS. Well, the same thing with the kernel device, you can each log it can either be an EEG or an FNIRS. And there, that seems to be like you could get complete coverage of the head with, you know, 
a mix of both types of sensors and then you'd have a pretty good mapping from what i understand they do have i mean again i i don't know the details but from what i understand the f the f -Nears component of the kernel does have a pretty decent sampling rate or is a continuous yeah, data stream yeah, but why would the sampling rate in, uh, in f -Nears, i understand the amount of uh, Sensors is important because you have quite a nice uh, right. localization precision, but I don't understand why it would help to have higher uh, sampling rate. Right. Uh, because the thermodynamic responses are not that fast, let's say. Right. So if they will do, I'm waiting for a time when FTUs will use uh, what's the code, what's called, uh, this technique which uh, splits the light into different frequencies. Mm -hmm. And you can check what we have in the blood. So not only if you have uh, O2 in the blood or not, but different. Uh, if we will be able to see neurotransmitters or, uh, or anything similar, then it will be an uh, extremely powerful uh, device. But before that, in theory, I know that in practice that's not true, but in, in theory, EEG should be more uh, powerful than FDS. Right. Uh, because it had, it's able to have the same uh, precision in uh, space as a years, and it has much higher uh, time precision, which is unobtainable for a years. I know that it, because the EG is much more uh, noisy, uh, and I mean by orders of magnitude, a years is much easier to use. Uh, but yeah. Oh, so we have uh, Josh. Uh, keeps oh, no, 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 no. Yes. Hi, Josh. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. We have a bit of an echo, but let's see if we can find it. I was on my tablet before. I had a feeling I might still be on. I think we can hear you quite well. Yeah. Okay, looks good. So, 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 so. Oh, geez. is it still echoing for you or just me? It's for all of us. It's for everyone now? Um, you might need to put in a pair of headphones or you can mute the audio on the device that you're listening to us on and then you can just talk normally and you won't be able to hear us, but we'll be able to hear you with a, yeah. without an echo. I'll, I'll do that for a while and I'll get questions through the chat. I'm sorry to make you go through this, Josh, but I'm so excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, we really appreciate you jumping through these hoops for us. All right. Um, uh, so, that, that okay. so um, I worked with Ted Berger. Um, it would be started uh, about 30 years ago, actually, when we were at Pitt. And um, we, his original premise was to grow neurons onto computer chips and fire them bidirectionally. Um, yeah, it was super cool. Uh, I was like an undergrad and it was like the most fascinating work. I was like, wow. And that's why it got me into neuroscience, honestly. Um, so, and um, he wanted to do more invasive work uh, and the IRB at Pitt was not really into it. So he moved to USC because they obviously had more than IRB. Uh, he's been there ever since. Um, I've run into him a couple times. Um, he was giving a talk at South by Southwest a couple years ago. I ran into him and it was fun to catch up. And But he's done, he's taken it so far. He's not only figured out how to do the, the lesion study that you're speaking of, C1 to CA3. Um, so they do a patch clamping and they figured out the algorithm as well. And it's like 96 to 97% accurate across all mammalians. It's like, or, or mimics, it's the exact same one. It's really crazy. Um, and so they did studies with rats where they would teach a rat, they would, um, and then they could patch clamp to other rats. So they'd have a naive rat that could, that had seen the maze, but not known how to actually operate through it. They just had a general concept of what it was. They would then 
take a map, a rat that was fully trained in the maze, connect the two together, and then do a lesion, lesion ablishment, ablishment on, on the subject rat, they would transfer the memory from the one rat to the other rat, and then the, the naive rat would then know the maze. Scary. Here's the creepier one. Ready for this one? They could teach a rat that knew how to do it, right? They taught a rat how to do it wrong, and then they could overwrite the wrong math method to the right one, to the one that actually knew what was going on. That's purely science fiction, truly terrifying, but uh, that is the truth of the matter. Um, so his work is really amazing. I know they're here trying to think they're trying to commercialize the, the patch clamp now at this point, I believe. That's the kind of game plan for patients with traumatic brain injuries and such. Um, so that's kind of where that's at. And I'll, I can. Uh, is that what was the last minute of the enterprise? I guess that I guess kind of. I'm not sure exactly the mechanism. I don't even think they really understand the mechanism. It's, it, but it's it's truly really bizarre. But the, I do know for I, I don't know, remember all the specifics of the wrong memory overwrite. But the but the new memory write in was actually very was perfect, almost perfect. So anyway, so that that's what I know in a nutshell. I I don't do that work anymore. I wish I would. Um, <laughs> I wish I'd stayed with them. But anyway, so uh, anyhow. And do you think there was a level of excitement? Sorry, let off. Oh, 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 oh. Well, I'll type it into uh, chat. Yeah, uh, just just us years ago, just getting neurons to fire off of a chip and the chip firing off a neuron was like, well, that was truly epic. Um, he did say though, when they figured out the algorithm, that was like. That's when the champagne blew off the pot, pot the, the, the corks, right? <laughs> so that was like the holy grail because there's all that stuff. There's all these translations that are going on through the hippocampus to, to do the reorganization to get up to C3. So it, once they figured out that algorithm, that was like they were in like flint. So I'll try and find some more of the articles and I'll post them here or um, I have them somewhere. I, I'll dig them up and, and, and post them up for folks. But it's fascinating work. He's a, and he's just an amazingly nice person. You can probably just email him. They'll just start talking to me super cool <laughs> so that's me that's it that's all i got to say about it, i guess really unless you have any other questions but yeah, sir. yes i will um i will try and find those um those articles for you and send them on to you guys so. yeah nathan asked yeah. a great question about the um one second uh, what information is actually being transferred in the rat experiment? Is it like a activity patterns of one cell or activity over a group of cells? That's a group of cells. It, 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 oh, 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 oh. Yeah, you gotta, oh. He was patch clamping across, uh, I believe it was the large, the, the, their bundle is I think 400 neurons. I think that's what the, the best that they've got. So it's not a, it's not a single neuron. It's, it's actually a patch clamping across multiple. Um, so, and, oh, and they did, did a study. That was a couple of years ago now. Uh, it just they just done it was at South by Southwest, and they got um, IRB approval for people who were, they were getting ready to go in for um, uh, epileptic ablation um, surgery, right? So they were doing all this all the brain mapping studies, and, and they got the IRB to let him actually you know put electrodes in the hippocampus and actually use check the algorithm to see if it actually worked. It worked in humans too. So they worked it all the way up from like low level you know rats through monkeys and all stuff and then got this like six or five or six patients actually in the study that could do it so i i you know and what they're trying to do now is to get a finer um uh finer electrodes so they can get more accuracy across and across a you know a, a broader uh, bundle um and then take that that tool to market but it seems like it's enough to do basic stuff it probably can't do like high level like you know rational functioning but i mean Run a route about an ace. Okay, it's fine. Four hundred runs is enough. <laughs> you don't need the twenty thousand or fifty thousand to do that sort of thing. So, pretty interesting. It's fascinating. Uh, and it's all research. And I, I never could guess why he's not more popular, and people are not speaking about him. Uh, it's all he, he's constantly making new improvements, uh, and this stuff that he he's doing. This is the. The basic, it's so basic in our understanding that through the base of your scientific courses, I have no clue why he's, uh, people don't speak more about, uh, about this. One more question. I have no idea either. Um, he's a very humble man, so that may be part of it. He might, he's not like a, he's not the showboater. Um, there's, I forget the gentleman's name. He put like $200 million down, like some, 
some guy who got billions and some, you know, dot com something or other. And um, he, they're working on like a full artificial hippocampus, uh, soup to nuts. I, I'll try, I'll find that article too. And he's got this like army of people working on this sort of stuff too. <laughs> so I'm like, it's people are, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's an interesting place because so much is going on. There. Anyway, that's what I did a lot of my work. So, um, I'll, I'll be glad. Oh no! Yeah, thank sorry you about so much. Thing to work with, right? Oh, <laughs> it's 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 so worth it. Thank you so much for for answering uh, info. That the mic problem is nothing, man. It's thank you, thank you so much. So Nathan's question was: Does it have to transfer a temporal pattern, or is it all in the spatial pattern of which cells are firing? If I correct, correct no, I the number, it's, um, it's both. I, I don't know. I, I, that's something that we have. We have. To, maybe we can get him to come here and give, give you know give a chat. Who knows? I mean, he's. I can probably reach out to him and see if he would you know <laughs> be interested. Please, you know. please. Uh, you'll be on my Christmas list forever uh, if that happens. And I mean, you might be on my Christmas list forever either way. I'm just saying. Look out! I send fancy teeth at the end of the holidays. Yeah, we'll see. If you if you like a nice tooth. So, okay, wonderful. Um, that is incredible. That is incredible to hear. Yeah, so this is this is why it's so awesome that we get these really cool questions about episodic memory transfer because, yeah, sure enough, we have done it. We've done research on it. We know the mechanism. We've discovered the algorithm. And, like, th this is why I love these, these hack nights because it's such a cool mix of, like, people working with data, doing experiments, talking about their research, and I, I learn stuff all the time. It's so, so fascinating. This is great. There is also a, a different technique which you can use from uh, a bit similar. Uh, there is quite a lot of research in uh, LFTP, the, 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 the moment when you place multiple electrodes in uh, in profile cortex, where you prefrontal cortex, sorry, uh, where people uh, record your working memory, and you can uh, if you uh, check high gamma. And by high gamma, this time I mean, uh, if I remember correctly, 90 hertz and above, or something like that. Uh, you can see how many items you have in the working memory. And if you are storing these items on the left uh, brain side oh. or on the right. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, some of the most. Oh, sorry, please. That didn't ask your question. We found some really interesting studies on pupil size as a predictor of intelligence, but all their all their experiments used working memory. What I can tell you is, I think it's 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 actually just a predictor of working memory capacity, which is really interesting. And for some reason, working memory seems to have this really direct correlation with pupil size, and it doesn't seem to be a task that's like compressible, right? It's kind of, and it sounds like you you could measure how many items are being tracked in which hemisphere that would be yeah. pretty fascinating to correlate and you're saying this is with eeg no 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 no, no. this is with lft oh, uh, if okay. I remember, so they have uh, had electrodes in prefrontal cortex uh, on yeah. both sides but uh and that, that's just a very wild guess uh because uh in studies that we are doing in brain attach we can see exactly the same patterns that we see in this lft recordings if you would have a uh, much higher density EEG, and I speak about hundreds of electrodes in performer code, like 128 electrodes on performer context, we should be able to recreate the, yeah, just recreate it. Wow. Uh, because th there is no, uh, there should be, if this uh, activity is in uh, cortical organs, which are near to the electrodes, uh, because we see the same patterns, we should be able to distrain them uh, from just the EEG, uh, as, as we see the same uh, behaviors uh, in our data. But yeah, that would need a much different device to work. And okay, but well, again, a seven. So sorry. sorry. It's eleven o'clock here. You still got to get. Oh, okay. Kids. Thank I'll, you so I'll much for doing this. I'll sign you next week, okay. and I'll find the yeah. for you. See you next Bye. week. Thank you so much. Take care. That was really nice. Yes. So, uh, and why I spoke about that, because uh, if you can see movement of uh, working memories, uh, uh, of memories or things that you keep in working memory from one side to the second, that means that you should be able to see a specific thing and maybe discern what is it, 
So with high enough precision, and I, I don't think that it, it would be enough, but maybe some combination of different methods, we should be able to, uh, to see, and I hope that with a uh, uh, device that will be not inside the head, uh, what you are exactly keeping in uh, the working memory. And yeah, from that you can do magic. But it's like decades, decades more in front of us. But yeah, we have the tech. Yeah. I'm really interested in that working memory seems like a fairly unique and specific task when you're testing it in um, devices. Like, I, I'm a psychologist by training. A neuropsychologist and in psychology working memory is the base uh, they say and it, it's shown in multiple experiments that working memory is a base of uh, intelligence so the uh, working memory capacity is the highest correlate uh, and the most stable correlate of the uh, of g and by g i mean this uh, this portion of intelligence which uh, which can be used to any task uh, that we're at so the part which is the same between different tests and things like that. So it seems that the capacity of working memory and its uh, precision is the G. It, it, it changes how intelligent we are, what we can do, how we can learn. How much information we can access yeah. at once. Yeah, because you can, you can have different processes depending on how many things you can have in working memory, you can create different ideas. Some ideas and uh, some methods are uh, undoable with, uh, with uh, lower limits. So, so we so should we... try to improve it. No, 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 I, I interrupted. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I ended. Yeah. We first looked at um, the, the, the literature on pupil size and intelligence when we started, because you know we just wanted to kind of get a sense of, is this gonna be a predictor of how people do in the games that we're gonna study? And I don't think we were necessarily wondering one way or the other, it was just more like, okay, according to the literature, you know, pupil size correlates with WMC and WMC correlates with G. And working memory capacity for others. Right. And so is this is this pupil gonna be a shortcut to how well people do in the game? And we found a very strange thing, which is no. Um, and quite the contrary, I think maybe some of our best performers have some of the lowest pupil sizes, which is completely contradictory to what I would expect. But maybe in this particular context, I guess something I never considered before is maybe it's a sign of focus in a positive way. Like maybe maybe you're not using general intelligence when you're playing a game. Maybe you're trying to be as task specific as possible. And maybe in that sense, you know, turning off some of those running processes and focusing on what you're doing might be a good thing. So just kind of interesting how even in this discussion. So, so I, I have something about that. Uh, it's exactly as you said. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, there is a uh, software called AIMLAB. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, helping you to learn how to shoot. Yeah, yeah, that's what we were uh, using yes, in, the, in the study. Mm -hmm. So I've tested it with our device, and uh, the thing that I uh, didn't think before uh, is that when you are com completely concentrate, uh, concentrated on uh, on shooting on single, very easy, repetitive task your brain, and let's get back to the snake, uh, gets into the apathy. Because this is a medita meditative-like state. Okay. If you are concentrating only on very, very narrow single thing, then your, your brain uh, activity goes down. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, some different kind of activity happens, but all their processes are uh, halted and you are concentrating only on this small part. And uh, that's, I would guess that uh, you have seen a similar thing with the popular telemetry. And yes. probably people which are unable to keep uh, cool uh, during uh, gameplay, uh, they will have higher uh, popular diameter. Right. It's, so, yeah. it's, there's a couple of contradictory processes that are happening, which is what makes the whole thing complicated like the, there's three or four things 
that are encapsulated with what you're describing. And yeah, and it's kind of like how well the player is doing. Do they understand the risk that they're in? Yes or no? Because sometimes people can be very brave if they don't understand they're in a terrible position. Um, and yeah. there's all kinds of interesting permutations. And so I think I think what we realized is when we were looking for a predictor of game performance, it wasn't as simple as pupil size. But I still believe that pupil size and working memory are correlated. And I agree that working memory is probably related to general intelligence. My conclusion was that games are a specific enough task that what we're testing is kind of like your trained pattern on that game and maybe not so much your general strategy or mm -hmm. th th there was both, but that we were getting a lot of your game specific strategy and maybe not all of your, your general strategy. So, uh, but that was yeah, really that's, interesting. Yeah. And when, when people are doing a strategy, they usually are not involved. Always, they are they have very high activity, so it, it looks completely differently. But they do that in different moments. Uh, yeah, we, we can see that in uh, two dimensions <laughs> with our software. And yeah, it, it's uh, fascinating to look at. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there is the, the, the fun thing that. Uh, that we have seen, for example, on games like League of Legends, is that people have their attention span. So, uh, depending on the game, people, uh, different people are better at different games because they can spend a different amount of time uh, with high attention at the, the detail. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And there's so many different <laughs> things. One of the things we started looking at was game length because we were doing recordings of different games and we were getting up with very different sizes of data and so on. Um, so there are games that are designed to be over in three to five minutes and they cater to very specific people. There are games that go for 12 to 20 minutes and there are games that go for 30 minutes plus. If you look at League of Legends, uh, a very typical one is 45 minutes and that's probably going to have something like three phases where there's sort of like an early phase of 15 minutes, a mid phase of 15 minutes and a late phase. And, um, yeah, I... I do get the sense that sometimes people kind of get overwhelmed or check out with some of these things. And then you see the people size tend to just sort of drop and they get disinterested. There's also a pretty steady drop over time, which is kind of strange, but then it resets if you do things. So mm -hmm. I have to tell you, having the pupil data, correlating it with other things, getting people in these experiments has been wonderful because when you do put it in a real world setting, you start getting all this context and rich data back. Yeah, we've made some of some similar tests, and yes, you can see that you have this attention on multiple levels. So you have these attentions, uh, attention windows which have few seconds. You have uh, attention uh, large windows which have minutes usually, and it also depends on on the person how was the length that they can uh, do. Uh, it, change, it probably changes with the position that the person is playing. So if, depending when they are important, yeah. So you should see, if you check League of Legends, you should see that this uh, steady downfall of attention will be different for different roles. Yes. Because people prepare differently and they have different comp composition. Uh, you can see this in, uh, in, their, um, in their personality uh, because the personality uh, is highly correlated with uh, how they react emotionally, what the lengths of the windows they have, but there's so much stuff uh, in it, and yeah. Yes, and I have to say, I, I really I agree with you that there's some fascinating changes. Um, for instance, I do think that people allocate a lot of attention up front and that it fades over time. Um, and to me, that was just really interesting. It reminded me of something I noticed in, sorry for, sometimes people get kind of, you know, you tie it into real world stuff and people go, I don't know. But like in sports games, uh, sports, real world sports, in particular American football, what I've noticed is that in the first quarter or half of the game, you know, yes, everyone is physically fit and whatever, but it's just very hard to score. You know, the defense is really alert. They're really energetic. They're really aware. They're really careful. And then I think the physical aspect is understood, right? The, the theory is, well, after about two hours of running around, you stop, you, you know, you don't have the same athleticism. But I think there's more to it than that. I think there's this mental fatigue. I think there's <laughs> tracking 11 players in your head simultaneously yeah. is easier to do when you haven't been doing it for two hours straight. And, and you can, yeah, you can yeah. see the brain activity. And 
And you, the, the thing that fascinates me is that you can see that on multiple scales. Right. Right. And they are not only on a few seconds and a few minutes. You have them in hours, days, weeks. We just don't have enough data at the moment, but it repeats its fractal. Uh, yeah, but the, the most things that we uh, we learn about that is not from the now. Uh, it's not from the export games, but from uh, our own game. Because when you have your own, that's why we created the game. Because yeah, it's yeah. uh, a great testing uh, place for uh, how people react to what, and uh, you can only fully understand what you are measuring if you are also controlling it. So the the creation of the closed loop. Uh, we are we are not using the TDS and uh, <laughs> electricity on brains, but we are using it on uh, in the game. So, we, that, may I present the uh, the gameplay? Sure, please. Yeah, sure. I'd love to see that. Mm, so let me give a minute, seconds. Sure, it's cool. Uh, I don't know where I heard it. I've prepared it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Can you see the... Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, this is the latest uh, version of the game. Mm -hmm. So, like usual, you have snake on the usual. You have snake on the right. Uh, the hydroplot is the same as the, the snake, but we, we see only the approach avoid. So we, can, we see no uh, arousal uh, in it because it will be too much uh, information at once. Uh, so here, the activity of all the monsters is tied to your emotions, and if you are uh, in the approach, it means that you you feel that you are in control of the situation, mm -hmm. and uh, if you are in control, monsters can attack you. And uh, you will see that whenever the person goes uh, into avoidance, so he, he feels overwhelmed, monsters get slower, mm -hmm. and whenever he gets uh, in, into approach, they get faster. Mm -hmm. uh, if you will try to correlate what's happening on the, uh, on the snake and uh, in the game. Uh, yeah, so it's very funny because people when they do it, when they are playing, they don't they are unable to see because too, too many things are happening at once. Right. Uh, to see them, but they feel uh, the difference. Uh, this is my uh, favorite part because uh, all the monsters other than this one are correlated with your uh, avoid approach reaction, but mm -hmm. uh, these demons are uh, not decorrelated, but they have the, the minus sign. So they attack you when you are not paying attention. And when ah, you are paying okay. attention, they are, they are skipping from you. So that's why they create so much uh, here uh, uh, in the uh, purple. That's why they create so much uh, emotions uh, in the person. And People constantly say that they really enjoy other monsters, but not this one, because it's uh, it's finding the the moment when you are not uh, not paying attention or you are f feeling unsafe, and they are attacking right. you exactly right. at that moment, making it much more problematic. So it, it's hard to see that in the video that they are problematic, but for a person who is playing, they are very uh, they are very problematic. Uh, yeah, and because it's hard to watch uh, so many plots, we've uh, changed the game in a way that it's changing its uh, look based on your uh, on your state. So the tiles and uh, trees and uh, other things in the game are uh, they magnify your state at the moment when when you were at that place. So you can see in which places uh, this person had a good fight. For example, here on the right, he was uh, feeling uh, in control. 
and uh, he went on, on, in the middle when he was fighting demons. Uh, he was not in, uh, sorry here uh, on the right when he was fighting the demon. He was not in control, so he had different uh, tile set in that uh, in that place. And that really cool. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the things that you can do when you have such a uh, a closed look uh, is really uh, fascinating. When you can see, it's not that easy. Uh, to create the behaviors, but once you have them, uh, the thing that fascinates me mostly is that you would be unable to create such a system uh, by designing by hand. Right. And uh, the feeling when you are playing is so different from when you are looking, because uh, you, we have only a small glimpse by the uh, by the plots, but your internal feeling that you have the high pressure on you all, all the time, you cannot see that in the in the video because yeah, they are attacking him or not. You don't see the, this attention windows that person has and that the monsters are attacking him when, when you are able to see them and when your your brain is uh, at lower state and it's unable to see what's happening, they are not. But he but the player doesn't see that because he doesn't have net attention to. Uh, to react, uh, to see. Yeah. So, so you wrote the game as a demo of the capabilities? Yes. But we have, like you can see, quite a lot of fun with creating the game. It looks fun. Uh, so I actually would really like to try it with the pupilometry yeah. and the EEG and see like, if we could find a, a set of thresholds that are sort of based on the other criteria. I mean, I'm not trying to, mm -hmm. whatever, just like, hey, okay, here is the pupil change. It's below this is probably a void, above this is probably approach. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when when my beta shifts from here to here, you know, we're going to get a change. But yeah, that would be amazing. It'd be super cool to check it out. Yeah, uh, we've invented this game because it all, uh, also is able to show you multiple uh, data at once. The, the, all the graphics in this game are made with clip. Mm -hmm. So they are auto-generated, nobody prepared them, let's say. Right. And, and what does it mean? It means that you can have uh, individual graphic for every mental state that you have. Okay. So after the game, you are able to, uh, to see graphically a multidimensional state that the person was in. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that that's the idea that I had in the last few weeks, that you could uh, see uh, the, the brain activity is extremely complex. There are too many variables to see them in any plot. You will be yes. unable to understand it or intuit what's happening. But if you will tie it to something like uh, Clip, which is able to work on hundreds of dimensions, mm -hmm. you you can at last, at least, sorry, uh, into it what's happening because you can see similar patterns, styles, and things like that. You will not uh, know what's happening, but you will have an intuition that you are in a different state and that this state has repeated and things like that. Uh, we are not using it at the moment uh, like that. We are using it to, uh, to adapt the game in every possible way so that the monsters adapt, the map adapts, difficulty adapts, and the the look of the game adapts to your uh, to your feelings. So this is a different idea, but it, it's uh, still in my mind that you could uh, teach people about their men all of their mental states. So mm -hmm. if you even had a 64 electro EG, right, right. you could see all that's happening that EG is able to uh, to see and show it somehow to a person, so that you could uh, have an intuition. How do you feel? How are you? Uh, that, and that now I'm in a different moment that I'm not ready for, and how much different? Yeah, I think I think that's a brilliant idea. I completely agree with you. We've been looking for the same thing, and we've looked at various ways to represent that. We had explored things like um, trying to create a chaotic attractor that was visually, mm -hmm. you know, interpretable, because at least that shape gives you some idea of coarse brain state. Um, we also implemented the uh, UCSD FOOF oscillation parameterization of EEG, which allows mm -hmm. you to quantify, compare, look at the shapes, see exactly what it mm -hmm. is. So at least that's somewhat visually interpretable. 
Um, and then, yeah, I, I really feel like if people can kind of get, we have the exact same problem and the exact same thing. You can sit there and show 20 plots to someone. If that person has never experienced it and they don't believe you, they think that this is just some <laughs> stuff you're, you know, putting together, you're going to dazzle them with, you know, jargon and they're going to buy some nonsense, right? They're, they're kind of looking at this with skepticism. But the first time someone gets in an eye tracker and sees that it can see exactly where they're looking and they can interact with their eyes and they can see elements, there's this like moment where they go, oh, wow, this is real. And I think that that game is going to do the same thing because I have to tell you the whole time I'm thinking, you know, these game developers don't believe the, they don't know and they don't have any proof. They haven't seen it, but man, you get one of your devices at a game studio where a game developer gets to experience what you're talking about. And they'll oh, believe I you. The, yeah. I did that. Uh, I, I, the, like I said, I'm, I'm doing uh, game research at the moment. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's going slowly, and I'm from Poland, so I'm working with small studios at the moment. But uh, when people get it on their head and see uh, their own emotions, or you see emotions of your friend which you have some model of, right. so you can right. guess how he's feeling and, and why, mm -hmm. it the people have such a, uh, large pupils <laughs> that they are. So into that, that they, uh, yeah, the, the, the first, uh, that, that's a funny story, uh, four years ago, I think, uh, I've done uh, uh, research, game research and I was showing something to a guy from a larger corporation. And uh, we had, I had some problems with signal quality, so in, in the last moment, uh, between, between the, before the uh, presentation, I changed some parameters in our method, which you should never do. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 I would not. Yes, yes. But, um, yeah, I, but I, I had to do something because there was too much, uh, too much noise. Uh, and so it happens that we are using this tweak to until this day because from that moment, met method started to work perfectly. So the guy that had uh, seen the, his reaction, uh, he yeah, we didn't have a luck. He he lost his work. Uh, two months afterwards, so we didn't have a deal. But he was so fascinated with what he had seen, uh, how precise was the, were the action, that he created the company. When he got to the, the cash, he created a company which is making game research, and uh, that's why I'm doing the game research now. That's wonderful. Because he was so fascinated with what he had, what he had seen. Uh, and yeah, we, we are seeing it spreading, but you, you will not believe if you will not feel it on yourself. That's right. Because like I said about the game, it's bland, so some monsters are moving, somebody's shooting, but when you feel on it's yourself... The feeling, the, it's the feeling. Yeah, the pressure. Yeah. The feeling yeah, exactly. is like uh, the first time you saw a magic trick when you were a kid, or the first time yeah. you experienced something wonderful. I, I truly can't... I, I know I'm hyping it up. People in chat like, oh, come on, dude, get over it. No, no, no. There's so, it's like seeing magic. It's the first time you get a BCI device working and it's real and you know it's real and it's sensing what's inside of you and you know that it's right because you're the only person that can, can confirm that, right? You're the mm -hmm. only one that knows. You just have this like experience of like, holy crap, this is real. I'm telling you. Um, a lot of people are going to be really delighted because the experience is, I, I found it incredible. Yeah, but, uh, the thing, uh, yeah, the, the, I have made, uh, I, the, this video is from today and it was made on a guy which is not a gamer, he doesn't like to play games, uh, he had problem with his uh, 60 years, uh, more than 60 year old and he had problems with even playing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But but that uh, this video is from his second play, and we didn't give him a chance to have a second play. He asked us, and right. the meeting was right. about something ex about something else. Right. Uh, right. But he, he liked the game so much uh, that he wanted to play once more, even if it was not good for the situation. But he wanted to play just one more uh, party in it because it, it, you feel. Exactly in the time. Everything is. Uh... Oh yeah. Thank you, Josh. Oh, this is wonderful. Yeah, I'm. I'm checking out that link. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. 
So, so yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. There's there's people who have experienced BCI working and there's people that haven't. And what I can tell you is I haven't tried yours, but just looking at the video, I, I could picture what I would experience watching, feeling it and doing it. And I'm like, that would be incredible. I would love to, uh, to you know, experience it myself. There is a visceralness to the experience that I didn't expect. Um, it mm -hmm. really brings out a joy to, to, to get the BCI stuff working. It's the pleasant yeah, part. Uh, and here we have, uh, 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 we already tested that you can change the parameters of the monsters and they, uh, because this, it's a closed loop, you can create different feelings in yourself. So this, uh, most of the monsters, like I said, they are correlated with your uh, uh, emotions and they feel like something is really nice, the, 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 everything is on its place. You are, they are getting you into the flow very fast, but you can create them in a different way. You can create them based on the uh, Aruzo. Mm -hmm. And you have no clue why, but you feel pumped, really pumped, like something impressive is happening. And you, you're, you have no clue why, because the situation, if you look at the, later, even on your, your own video, you are unable to make it why it was you felt so much pressure but you feel it so uh, i hope and we are slowly testing it uh, that we'll be able to teach people how to um, work with their emotion uh, the arousal how to control it uh, in a better way by uh, choosing which algorithms that people have which monsters of which type they need how often and things like that, so that it will be fun and therapeutic uh, for person who is playing. Because it's uh, uh, this is a um, uh, your, your feedback on steroids, because it's you have a life and pleasant look uh, for it. I have no clue what will be the consequences, and we are trying to check it. It will take a lot of time to check the long term consequences of it, but we are already trying to test it because the feeling is so strong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's incomparable. I have been on biofeedback detention. It's incomparable to the things that you can feel uh, doing biofeedback, because it, it's visceral, like you said, it's very uh, powerful, and it should have some consequences. I have no clue what consequences. Uh, I hope that it, that we will be able to make them good and everything. If we do everything properly, they should. Uh, be good. I really find that very interesting um there's there's a, one of the games that we were very interested in researching is called starcraft 2 and um it's a 1v1 strategy game that's played for between 10 minutes and an hour uh it's pretty unusual for a match to go more than 20 30 minutes but they do sometimes and um it's a very intense game. and um oh, yes. the first few minutes Players have to get established and figure out what the other is doing. But what was really interesting to me is in listening to a lot of pros and watching a lot of footage, it turns out that there's a couple of consistent effects that StarCraft players have to kind of learn to overcome. Um, and it seems like through functionally through the game, they ended up figuring out how to overcome those things with a tool like yours where you could actually show that that's happening. I think that that would be an incredible thing. So let me just try to explain. Um, First few minutes of a StarCraft II match are full of uncertainty. You could be doing anything. Your opponent could be doing anything. You don't know what they're doing. You're not sure if what you're doing is the right thing. You could be about to lose and not know it. And that's an incredibly tense and stressful situation. And so what's interesting is that players seem to develop this strange cognitive illusion where they believe that their opponent is doing great and that they're not doing well. And um it creates a sort of they feel aversion and they think that their opponent has the approach right so both players feel that they're on the back foot and that the other player has them at a disadvantage and over time the better players sort of learn that that's not the case that that both players are sort of in the same footing but that you're fighting um a set of feelings that are kind of normal and that you have to kind of learn to train yourself to experience them differently. And so you could actually take a novice player and show the amount of avoidance, apathy, fear, whatever, 
for the first five minutes. And you compare that to like an excellent player, and you just see that they're fine. Even if they're going to lose the match, they're just not concerned. And I think it's incredible that people learned how to emotionally regulate that well within a game. But a video game isn't life, and yet it can be a good training for life. And yet mm -hmm. if we find the metrics and the approach that helps people change the mindset in the game, then why not in life too? And I really think that that's incredibly powerful. I mean, it just seems like a, a cool thing that you could do with this. I, I like StarCraft, so I would probably make a video and send it to you if you want. Uh, I'm happy to discuss it because it, it will be fun. Uh, if you make research on games also, that it's, I do it mostly because it's fun and we learn a ton uh, by doing that. But uh, in StarCraft, there's one more thing. It's extremely taxing on your working memory. Yes. And yes. if you watch uh, pro players uh, in the end game, uh, good pro players are trying to overtax the opponent. Yes. yes. Because yes. when you overtax somebody on their working memory, they are making mistakes, and this is the moment where you have uh, the opening. It's fascinating to watch how people create uh, a small false problems for opponent. Yes. So that yes. can be overtax. Yes. It's actually yeah, a cognitive yeah. battle of attention, yes. focus, resources, and priorities. And um, yes, exactly like what Ibrahim said. That's that's precisely the kind of analysis yeah. you want to do between Terran, Protoss, and Zerg. Which race is the most <laughs> cognitively intensive? And what does the what what does the cognitive trajectory for the race look like? Right, because so StarCraft can be up to a 20, 30 minute match. So Zerg will probably ramp earlier. Sorry. Are you doing research on OpenBCI? Um, we use, uh, for the most part, Neurosity crowns um, because mm -hmm. they're... They have uh, I have nothing to their device. They just have electrodes in different places than I need. Yes, yes, exactly. So for, for what we do, for our case, our users mm -hmm. don't want flexibility, they want ease of use, but, but yeah. good quality. Uh, for your application, mm -hmm. I think OpenBCI or, or a unicorn, um, I do have a unicorn here, which gives me some flexibility, um, but I haven't, as you can see, I just got it from, from Austria, so I still need to assemble it and use it. But yeah, if you wanted different electrodes, obviously something like that, you know, where you can have a flexible cap or an OpenBCI. No, I've been so you want more, more prefrontal, I'm guessing, right? No, I, I, I need to exactly the uh, lateral electrodes on the okay. contact context. Okay. Uh, but if you would have such a recording, I'm quite happy to uh, take them to our pipeline and se okay. send you the results. That'd be great. That's okay. what I mean. But, but, but we need quite high quality of the signal and high uh, frequency rate. So with 512 hertz, it barely works, uh, but it should be doable. Oh, so you need At least for start. Right. Yeah, oh. that, that, we didn't want to make a device. We had this technology for quite a long time, and uh, but we uh, could not. Uh, we tried to talk with people which uh, create devices, but they didn't want to have uh, higher frequency rates, and we were unable to work with the quality of the data that was on the market. And yeah, nobody has a sample rate over three hundred right now. Yeah, and it's. Uh, I'm not sure how they are going to do it from my perspective because it's. Uh, Okay, you can have large patterns, or you, know, you repeat something, it works, it's nice. But if you want to have really high precision, and I mean high time precision, uh, and reliability of your signal, even for uh, uh, for cleaning of the signal, you need much more, uh, from my perspective. Uh, at least our method needs uh, quite a little data. Josh, you bring up an excellent question, sorry to... Yes, the, the car racing adrenaline, I think, is very real. I, I used to do track days, and um, I have this device called an Emotibit. Um, I've linked it before. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in chat. Um, it gives you temperature, heart rate, respiratory, uh, everything, Temp skin conductance, all of it, biometric lab to go. Um, I think it would be, yes, yes, it has PPG as well. Uh, and you can put it on your arm, you can put it on your leg, you can put it on anywhere you want. It just needs a, a strap and it's got an SD card. So you don't need 
connectivity. You don't need any nonsense. You can literally just hit the button mm -hmm. on it that, that starts a recording. So yeah, I think that um, I am sure that from what I know, the, the stress response like right before you start a race is unbelievable. The adrenaline dump is incredible. The, the skin conductivity, the palpitation, the heart rate. I mean, I really, I really kind of like feel as amped as I get the moment before we start a race. And like for the first few minutes, I'm just bouncing off the walls and then kind of like I settle down. And by the time of the end of that 20 minute session, I'm struggling to stay awake in the car, which is like ridiculous. But like the, the, the neurochemical dump is so bad. I'm on my hangover and, you know, and I'm ready to, to wrap up that session and hopefully not in it. Um, I do think that I do think that you could use um, like a simulator of an actual experience we we're about to do. I think VR would help a lot with the immersion. It's just what I hear from people consistently is that the field of view, the 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 drowning out all the other stuff is a huge immersion game. And they have these really fancy like multi six degree of freedom, four degree of freedom, three degree of freedom simulators. So I think if you did a track that you were gonna do and um tried to put yourself in that setting it'd be interesting to measure using this emote of it like okay if you prep for the track ahead of time how much of a response do you get on the track versus if you just go on the track and you haven't done any any simulator stuff i think those kinds of experiments are so cool and we can we can start doing them really soon with a few hundred dollar devices i think that's that's wonderful um and so yeah the 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 VR games use a lot of, um, I did link one earlier, the, the System 2 Neuroscience, but let me just, um, let me just find their video it's on their website. And I'll link it in here. System 2 Neurotech, yes, okay, this is the one. Great. So this is an example of them using a VR headset with a simulator, FNIRS and EEG to sort of record a user. But I absolutely think we could. Driving games seem to be a, a good method for this stimulus. And really, the VR, I think, is what's going to take it to the next level for researchers. Without VR, you don't have a controlled environment. There's a lot of variables. It's not very immersive. The stimulus is OK. But I think that for this kind of research, um, absolutely, it's going to be coming down the road. And as I mentioned last week, the, the HP training, I'll, I'll link another video. Uh, okay, so this was a video we covered last week, but I'll give you a timestamp. Uh, yes, exactly. And it shows them using cognitive load pupil size in training for like electricians that are working on a high voltage thing where they need to follow a set procedure, you know, turn off the breaker and then mess with the wires. Um, and they give you like all kinds of metrics on how you did the task, how, how much cognitive load you had during the task, like how hard your brain was working. And then they also track it over time. So as people learn the task, their cognitive load goes down, their performance goes up. And you can find some kind of inflection point where you say, at this threshold, I believe you've learned it, right? You, you have it to the standard that I want. So this, this is just getting started. Anyway, this, this is shipping now. HP just started shipping last week. It's a twelve dollars to $1,500 device, and they're completely going after the corporate market with the eye tracking, the heart rate, the gesture emotion, and the cognitive load stuff, the SDK. So we're, we're like here, a $1,200 device is a full on telemetry lab and they give you the raw data for free. They give you the raw data for free. When I saw that, I couldn't believe it. You get the pupil data for free. It's just, I mean, I mean, you get the raw, you have to process it yourself, but you get it. Uh, most of these devices charge you an arm and a leg to, to get the raw data. So this was incredible. So we're, we're really close. We're really close to that BCI feature. 
Well, I think we've made it to nine o'clock, which is midnight for the East Coasters. Uh, I can only guess it's like four or five in the morning for you. Uh, it's six o'clock. All right, we're off by an hour. <laughs> okay, well, I hope you've had a lovely evening joining us. I certainly have uh, enjoyed having everyone there. Yep. This is so it's a pleasure. This was just a great hack night. I hope everyone had a chance to ask any questions. I hope to see everyone next week and we'll continue our discussion. But thank you so much, everyone. Great. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. See you all. <laughs>